Good morning, everybody. I'm glad you made it last day. Um, and today, Graham Barnes is gonna is gonna give us a little bit of a flavor of what it is like to disambiguate the magnetic field vector, mostly in the photosphere, I would say. Um, but I forgot to tell you that within the tar file that I uploaded, um, it's not only the disambiguation code, but also a Jupyter notebook that he's gonna be running. So please download the tar file for sure and like untar it and find the Jupyter notebook so you can actually play along with, two, with Graham. Three, and if you've Red not done it, like, do it in the next couple of minutes, and then we can start. I'll actually, I'll modify that slightly and say, I'm hoping you guys are going to be playing in the Jupyter Notebook and I'm not going to be doing too much of it. I mean, I'll show if, if, you know, if there's issues or anything like that, but I tried to set it up so hopefully you can kind of just walk through a few steps and, um, and go for it. So. And feel free to put your mask up if you want to, to speak, just because we're okay. doing the recording, but if you don't feel free. To sure, speak. I can do that. I'll I'll try and just stick to this mic, I think. Yeah. Do okay. you want me to give another couple minutes for people to come in or okay. got it. One, two, three. Okay. Four, five. Thanks. So yeah, I'm going to talk about disambiguation one, two, techniques. Three, uh, I'm going to talk for probably half an hour or so, give you an overview one, of two, some, three. we'll focus on one particular method. Then we may just take like a five minute break, switch to the Jupyter three, Notebook for a while. And then uh, after playing with that for a little bit, I'm going to come back and talk about some other, seven, I guess I'll say sort of more experimental methods or methods that depend a little bit more on the data source that you have. And since this is the only disambiguation part of this school, I'm going to try and give you a little bit of an overview and, and some motivation, things like that to start with. So this will probably make the actual spectrophotometry people scream, but I wanted to just do a really quick motivation of this. I think you've been really down in the weeds in the last couple of weeks in terms of radiative transfer and all the details of things that are going on. So I wanted to sort of back up for a little bit and just say, okay, we're going from, you know, photons to field, hopefully. And in a really hand-waving sense, um, I have B tells me something about B along the line of sight. Q squared plus U squared tells me something about the transverse component. And then this angle is something like an arctangent of U over Q. Um, sure, that's not anything like what you've been playing with recently, but just kind of as a reminder that there really is this issue here that when I take an arctangent, it's ambiguous, right? If I really want to get the full 360 degrees. And so this is the, the, the ambiguity that I'm talking about that after the inversion has come back and given you these quantities, typically you still don't have all of the information about the vector field. Um, and so, well, let me just go on and say, why does this matter even? This is an example of curved surface here is supposed to be the sun. I've got a little eyeball up here looking down. Here is an unambiguous line of sight component of the field. And then this green horizontal line are the two sort of choices for the transverse component. So I'm imagining here that there's no component coming out of the plane. And essentially this ambiguity is just which direction does that green arrow go? And so the two possibilities give me the red vectors as what the field could be. Uh, sorry, the blue as what the field could be. The thing to notice about this is that if I then go to kind of the physical components of the field, if I look at the radial component and the horizontal component, which are the things that I typically want to have if I want to do physics with this, well, even the radial component can switch sign depending on which choice of disambiguation I make. So this is the kind of thing where there's a tendency for people to say, oh, you know, the line of sight is close enough to the radial, especially if I'm near disk center. And so, you know what, I'm just going to use that instead. And sometimes you can sort of get away with that, but it turns out that you really don't have to be very far from disk center before you even start to get the sign of the radial field wrong. And that's important for even simple things like the flux, right? So this is really kind of an important thing that if I'm interested in more than looking at my sort of one little pixel and trying to understand all of what's going on in, in detail, if I really want to analyze sort of magnetic field maps and do other physics from them, this is something that I really have to take into account and work through. Uh, and just in case it isn't clear, like stop me at any time if there's questions or comments or anything like that. Okay, so how do I do this? Again, remember that for a typical inversion, and I'll come back to that later, <clears throat> 
there's no sort of physics that's going to resolve this ambiguity for me. So what I end up doing, or what the methods basically do, is they make some kind of additional assumption or approximation, which we hope is true for the sun, but we don't actually know is true for the sun, or maybe true for most places at the photosphere, but isn't necessarily true everywhere. Um, there's typically kind of two general families of approach. One is to use a reference field. Um, that's usually a potential field or a linear force free field. I compute that field. I look at the transverse component that it generates and I say, okay, let me pick the disambiguation which gives me the closest match to that. Um, there's another sort of category of families which are essentially to pick a functional and then minimize it typically globally or at least iteratively rather than, so this, this sort of reference field approach is relatively local. You compute the reference field and then at each pixel you compare. The functional approach is typically neighboring pixels influence each other. And so there's some kind of either iterative or, or global approach to that. And I'll come back and go into these in a lot more detail. Um, but even in this functional approach, often what happens is buried somewhere underneath the surface is a potential field approximation for some term in that functional. So almost always I come back to, well, the sun's not potential, but maybe it's close enough that I can get some information out about which direction things should go. And again, in some sense, this is a really coarse decision, right? I have, I have two choices, it's this way or it's that way. So you'd like to think that that's not such a hard thing to pick that even a little bit of additional information would kind of nudge me towards what hopefully is the right solution. Um, there's another sort of note here. A lot of these methods, they do this approach once and then there's some kind of like smoothing that happens either as part of the process or at the end. And I, I'm gonna lump that under the assumptions. You're basically saying something like, I believe the field is smooth on the spatial scales that I'm looking at. And that's why smoothing makes sense is to say that it doesn't vary radically. If it does, that means something went wrong in my solution. Um, there's a reference here for an overview. The next slide, I will list a whole bunch of methods just to give you a sense of what's out there. Um, I put a footnote on all methods relying on this. A lot of what you've been doing this week or last two weeks, I guess, has been looking at gradients along, if not line of sight, at least in optical depth. And so there's a tendency to say, well, can I use div b equals zero? Can I put more physics in there? And we're gonna come back to that later. <laughs> um, partly that's because what I'm gonna talk about first are methods that don't require gradient information. So they basically will work for pretty much any inversion that you wanna use. We'll come back to the div B in the context of other kinds of either specific information that I need that is inversion specific or instrument specific or things like that. And it turns out this is not as easy as it might seem. And I'm, I'll, te I'll actually tease the scientists and say, there's actually maybe some interesting physics in this too. Okay, so <laughs> here's a, I guess I would call it extensive, but by no means complete list of methods that have been tried. Um, I'm definitely not gonna talk about all of these. I'm just gonna sort of give some general comments on the categories of them. These first few up here are reference field type methods. So the first couple here are potential field acute angle, but even within that, you see there's a, a bunch of different names listed there. Turns out computing a potential field is not so straightforward as you might think either. Um, mathematically it is potential field, just as a reminder means no currents, right? And so, Mathematically, if you have the normal component of the field defined on a closed surface, it's unique, well-defined, and all the rest of it. But we never basically have a closed surface on the sun. And we often don't actually have the normal component. So you can imagine that there's all kinds of ways to then go and implement this that don't necessarily give you the same answer. And so you can do also within that, you can look at using Fourier transform methods, you can use Green's function methods, you can choose to match the line of sight component rather than the normal component and, and so on. And then you have to do, make some assumptions about what you do on the side and top boundaries and all the rest of it. So even though this sounds like a simple approach, in some sense it really is, it isn't a unique approach in that depending on how you implement it, you can actually get different answers. Slightly more advanced than that is to use a linear force free method that basically says that the current density is proportional to B and it's a constant proportionality. So that's also something that I can calculate very easily from just knowing the normal component on the boundary <clears throat> plus some way of computing what this force-free parameter should be. Um, the next method, ASAM, is familiar to the HAO folks because it was premiered here. Uh, it typically can be initialized by one of these sort of potential field acute angle or similar type methods, but essentially, 
it's an interactive method. You do it by hand. And when uh, E. Lights here is Bruce, he was here for many, many years. When he was developing this, that was sort of realistic to do. But when you start looking towards things like HMI data, or as we look towards DKIS data, unless you want to have the whole army of people doing this all the time, it's really not a realistic thing to do. So it can actually work fairly well if you're interested in one specific thing and you think you understand what's going on, but it's not a realistic technique to use for the majority of the time. Um, these next set of methods get into basically making other assumptions about what goes on. So we're not doing the reference field anymore. We're looking at kind of some kind of other assumption or, or optimization. Um, I'll just pick one as an example. There's a method here which assumes that the magnetic pressure decreases with height. And if you make that assumption, decreasing with height gives you some information about it, like a vertical derivative, basically. And so that's a way to get at which way the, the ambiguity should go. And if you think about the photosphere, most of the time that's probably true, right? The field strength gets lower as you go up in height, but it's not true everywhere. And so there's definitely structures where this is not the right thing to do. So again, a method that works probably a lot of the time, but not all of the time. Um, I won't necessarily go through all the other similar kinds of assumptions of assume the field does this, it usually works, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, the last few methods here focus on actually looking at the electric current density and essentially saying I should have the smallest current density I can have. Now, without, again, height information, I can only compute the vertical component of that because it only relies on horizontal derivatives. Um, but basically the idea is that if I have a field which changes direction very rapidly, so if I have field pointing sort of opposite directions in neighboring pixels, that essentially gives me like a current heat. It gives me a huge current. And this in a, in a sense is back to this idea that we think the field is spatially relatively smooth, that we don't see a lot of these kinds of current sheets being present. So some of these methods then try in different ways to minimize something like the magnitude of the vertical current density. Um, several of them also incorporate an approximation to div B. And I'm gonna talk about this bottom method, the minimum energy solution in more detail. So we'll get to that in a second um, in terms of what the approximation is and, and what we do with it. But this is to just give you a flavor of there's a lot out there. And I don't, like I said, this is not comprehensive. So I apologize to, I realized this morning I left off a method, for example, by Rudenko. So just <laughs> for anyone who hears this, I'm sorry if I left your method out. But then the question is, which is best or which should I use? And we had a couple of workshops quite a long time ago now to try and answer that question. Um, the problem is we don't know the answer. And I think you've heard some of this in, in uh, in the talk yesterday morning in machine learning about like, I wanna train my machine learning, but I need the answer in order to do that. So this is kind of similar that we don't actually know what the answer should be on the sun. So we can do things like we can pick example fields, analytic fields, simulation fields, and things like that, and apply the methods. We can try to reproduce some of the instrumental effects and things like that. But ultimately we're still back to, we don't actually know if we got the answer right on the sun. Um, however, I will show you some of the results from this because some of these methods, you, when you see where they fail, you're fairly sure that they're not going to work everywhere on the sun. And so at least it maybe lets us rule out some of the methods. The ones that do more or less perfectly on the test cases, let's say you're still eligible, but we don't necessarily know that they're giving us the right answer in, in any case. So here's test case number one. Um, this is from a very old simulation by Yu Hong Fan. This was basically the emergence of a twisted magnetic flux rope. In the image here, the blue and red contours are of the radial magnetic field. And the arrows show the direction of the horizontal field with a, a length proportional to the strength of it. The black curve here is the polarity inversion line. So dividing between the positive and negative polarity. And essentially what you have is sort of the foot points of this twisted flux rope. And then you have an arcade field, which has foot points out to the sides here. And the grayscale is sort of like a proxy for a continuum intensity. The thing that's sort of interesting about this is that in a lot of areas like here, you see the arrows go sort of straight across the polarity inversion line from positive to negative, which is kind of the conventional orientation. But because of the current associated with the flux rope, there's an area here in the center where the arrows are almost aligned, or in fact, in some places cross from negative to positive, the reverse sort of direction to what you'd normally think of. Those are, in some sense, probably relatively rare on the sun, 
but they're also really interesting for a lot of people who are in, you know, looking at things like flux ropes and wet, which leads into all kinds of space weather topics and things like that. So this is an area that you'd really like to get right because there's possibly some interesting things going on there. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with it, this, this area is called a, a bald patch, which is the reference to when basically the orientation of the field is sort of backwards to the expected. Okay, so I won't again necessarily go through this in detail. Each one of these panels corresponds to one of the methods that was listed on the previous or the slide a couple uh, iterations ago. Um, essentially, black is correct and white is incorrect. So this is a simulation, so we know what the answer is, which is great. Um, and they loosely go in sort of the same order that I went through in the next presented. So a lot of the top ones are these reference field type ones, and down at the bottom are more of the ones that are optimization type methods, making some assumptions like that. Uh, and just I'll highlight it here, probably can't read this. This is ASM. So Bruce actually did get this one right. Um, but what you see is that this area that we were highlighting along the clarity inversion line is actually pretty hard for a lot of these methods. Many of them are failing in those areas. And that's not necessarily surprising. This is where we have a very non-potential part of the field. Um, there's a few other just crazy cases where in fact that area was done correctly and everything else was wrong. Um, but when you get down to some of these sort of minimized JZ plus div B type terms, you see that, yeah, sometimes there's little pieces that are not quite right, but overall they do pretty well in this. So I'm gonna just sort of say like this family of methods is preferred for at least this kind of case. Um, I'm skipping test cases, obviously. So there, there were four that were done. I'm just gonna highlight a couple here to give you a flavor for things. This is actually an, an analytic field, same convention of the red and blue contours are positive and negative of the normal component. There are arrows that are probably not very visible there. <clears throat> the thing that we wanted to test here basically was what happens when you add essentially photon noise. So we started from an analytic field, essentially generated spectra from that, added noise to the spectra, re-inverted, very simple inversion, not trying trying to like make anything complicated out of it. But the question basically was, are these methods robust when you're not measuring the field perfectly? And there are several noise levels. So this is essentially no noise. I think this was medium noise and, and large noise. And you see here, for example, the contours are very smooth. Everything is kind of well-behaved because this was an analytic field. You start to see some wiggles in the contours here as the noise comes in. And by the time you get to this, there's some kind of crazy structures and things in there. So let's take a look at how some of these methods performed on that. Um, this is now a subset, and these are generally the sort of better performing ones from the test case number one. And then going from left to right is increasing amounts of noise. So this top row is one method, no noise to high noise, same convention of black is correct, white is not. There's a little bit of a question here of, well, what actually is correct when you have noise? We know what the underlying magnetic field is with no noise, but that's not what the inversion returns. So you actually have to also think a little bit about what it even means to get things right when you have a noisy answer. And essentially what we did was to say, well, if it's within 90 degrees, we're gonna call it right. If it's more than 90 degrees, we're gonna call it wrong, kind of the obvious thing. But it is important to remember that we aren't actually getting the field perfectly. Um, and we see basically that noise in this sense, and again, this is just sort of photon noise. So there's no biases or anything in this, doesn't make a whole lot of difference. If an area was wrong in, the sort of perfect model, you start to see some sort of like hash to it, like certain pixels are right and certain pixels are wrong. But by and large, there's not a lot of difference in the areas. So the noise doesn't seem to make a really profound difference to most of these methods. Um, if we go down to one of the bottom ones, again, this was essentially a perfect answer in the no noise case. And there's a few little structures here where it starts to show up as being wrong in high noise. And this really is very high noise compared to a lot of what I think you've probably been looking at recently. So that was encouraging. Like these methods don't seem to be too sensitive to noise issues. Okay, well, let me pause for a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk in detail about this minimum energy method. So any questions or comments on sort of like the overview of this is what's out there? I'm scared of anyone. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Multi, multi component budget. So when you're doing these things, you are doing them essentially just on the photospheric maps, correct? 
or so, is it something that you would also do when you have, if you have some chromospheric? Um, um, so the caveat I would say to this is it's done on a single height. It doesn't really matter what that height is in the sense of there's nothing inherent about the photosphere in this, but we're not using more than one height at a at time. time. Okay. I will come back to the multi-height thing at the end of this. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, because in the chromospheric case, uh, sort of, of minimizing the current sheets might not work. <laughs> you know, that, that that is probably something that I would expect to have a lot of in a chromospheric case. But that's a, it's an interesting question. And let, let me try and make a distinction here, see if you agree with this or not. Um, it may still be the case that minimizing is correct, but there still will be current sheets. And so part of this is getting away from the idea that like, if there's a lot of current sheets, I mean, let's say, how do I say this? If there are really current sheets in, the chromosphere, which presumably there are, um, you know, this method is going to try and minimize how many there are, but it's highly unlikely to me you could get fewer than are really there. Like, I don't know that you could remove them by doing one of these methods. I can't say I've really tested that. That would be a really interesting thing to look at is to put in not smooth fields and see what we get. Um, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Like I, and I think it's, Well, let me, let, me, let me leave it at that. I'll come back to the multi-height thing okay. for sure, because that's okay. actually quite important. Yeah. Um, and you'll see effectively current sheets in that too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently I targeted this at the wrong audience. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, it's, 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 all, it's all really good. I, it's just out of curiosity, uh, but when you go to chromospheric lines and in the regime of scattering polarization and so on, then you encounter multiple ambiguous solutions, not just to is that something that these kinds of codes could potentially deal with or not? Yes. Um, I'm pausing for a second. I think most, if not all of them, could deal with that in the sense that obviously there'd be, there'd be a little bit of editing of the code, but the concept is still the same that, um, since I've got this up, maybe, let me, let me actually answer that in the context of what I'm gonna talk about right here. Was there another question before I kind of dive into that? Yeah. Does the sort of the, the spatial resolution play a role here? Like if your simulation is showing sort of finer magnetic field structure and smaller scales, uh, do the methods find it like easier or harder to sort of disambiguate those? those so, so we actually, that was test case number four that I didn't show you. <laughs> um, we took a field that was very small spatial scales and then we sort of did various degrees of, of binning of it. And again, sort of binning the spectra to try and Im imitate what an actual observation would produce. And the answer is a little complicated in the sense of it's not, not, the case we did wasn't totally clean in the sense that there are other effects going on too. And so it's a little hard to disentangle what was specific to the spatial resolution versus what was not. Some of the methods two, had no three. problem with it, but so whether that was because four, five, you know six, they were just generally well or not, seven, eight, eight. not totally clear. Other methods did have issues that when you really got to things that were not very well resolved, they kind of fell apart. Um, the issue, actually, maybe this is, maybe I can lump both of these questions together at some, at some degree. Um, what I've got up here is, I'll come, I'll come back and explain like why we're interested in this in a second, but something which includes a current density and a divergence of B. Both of those include horizontal derivatives, right? How do you get a horizontal derivative? Well, typically you're doing something like a finite difference. And the finite difference assumes that the field is varying in a way that sort of that's a reasonable approximation to make that things aren't changing crazily between one pixel or next. And so if I'm not resolving stuff, my derivatives are not particularly meaningful done this way. Um, and so that's, you know, that's part of what goes on to these methods is that sometimes when I can't resolve something, I'm probably not getting a good approximation to what I think I'm minimizing. And the other piece of it though is, and I come back to, I'm trying to choose between you know this and this, right? Like two very different solutions. And so maybe even if I'm not getting the actual current density right, it doesn't make too much of a difference. But to Rebecca's question, if I'm choosing between like this and this and this, let's say like if I have three different choices, I'm, I'm obviously just kind of making this one up, but in this minimization that gives me now three values for J, possible values for, for J. So I can still apply a minimization. It's just, I'm minimizing over more different options. And so the way these, and so I'm kind of doing this a little bit backwards now, but um, 
this particular minimum energy method is based on using simulated annealing, which is a, a global up on energy technique. And I'll say a little bit more about it in just a second. You pick an energy functional and you basically simulate the needle is a way to try and figure out what is the smallest value for that, given these choices of which direction does the transverse component of the field go. In the typical formulation that most of what you're going to see, that's there's two choices at one location or at one height, and that's all we've got. But there's other versions that we've written of this, and I'll talk about them in more detail later, where you can say, well, maybe I have two locations in optical depth, and I can flip the solution at either of those independently. And so there's areas where you can say, as long as I can formulate what the change in the current density of say is between whatever number of choices they have, I can still apply this algorithm. It's still trying to just minimize a quantity. And so if, if the assumption is correct that like the true field does give you a minimum to this, then it doesn't really matter sort of like how many options you're choosing from as long as you can figure out what the change in the current density and, and div B is amongst those. Um, the issue, well, let me, let me talk about why we actually picked this function. Div B obviously should be zero, <laughs> hopefully, but in order to compute div B, you need basically dbz dz. You need vertical gradient information, which isn't always available, I'm gonna say for right now. Um, and so it's typically approximated by a derivative of the potential field. So that's basically saying, I'm not doing div B exactly, but I'm doing something which is hopefully close to it. And then J here, well, this is a little bit back to John's question about, um, you know, what happens if I have current sheets and things like that? Well, we're treating J in some sense as like a smoothing term. And so we've actually tried this not using J itself, but using some other kind of ways of saying neighboring pixels should not point in wildly different directions and things like that, because it's not actually obvious that J normal really should be minimum. Um, but I don't know for sure. And I love the idea of doing some like real current sheet tests. I think that's a great suggestion. Um, but I, I do sort of want to point out like physical interpretation wise, this is a little bit misleading of, I don't know that the sun's in a state of minimum total J in some sense. Okay, questions on that. If this makes sense, but I should relate it to the current sheet. You actually have some information if it's happening based on line of sight gradients that we have, let's say. Say that again, if you have information on line of Yeah, line of sight, I mean, velocities, like I say. Can we then say something about the existence of these current sheets? So, um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I think I'm not aware of any method that uses velocity information, um, but that's an interesting idea around just, is there some other physics we can put into this? Yeah. Um, historically, most of these approaches were, maybe I'll just say they're lagging behind the inversion and observational data that we have now. And so there's, as you saw from the dates on the workshops, you know, these are like, 15, 20 years ago. And so there isn't necessarily been a lot of work to try incorporating new information from what we can get out at this point. So love the ideas. If you guys are interested in working under this, let me know. <laughs> you know? Um, I think there's potential to do a lot of improvement. Um, the other thing this comes back to, you know, Bruce and Azam and how long it takes is, Sometimes there's also computational limits on what we can realistically do with some of this. And so a lot of what we went into this, you, you'll see this method being referred to as ME0, which sounds a little bit weird because the original one was ME and then there's actually an ME2 and an ME3 and they got progressively more and more complicated. And I was one of the people who rewrote this as ME0, which was intended for the HMI pipeline because the more complicated version basically couldn't keep up with the data coming in. Um, so this is actually kind of like the stripped down version of some of the more complicated things, but it gave essentially the same answer. So we weren't so worried about like what we'd taken out, but there's a trade-off between, can we put more information in? Maybe we get a better answer, but we can't do it all the time. And, and that's, that's something to explore for sure. All right, let me talk about 
simulate an annealing for just a second because this will tell you a little bit why this is computationally intensive. Um, so recall that you know we're taking horizontal derivatives with finite differences to get these terms. What that means is that my value of j depends on not just the pixel where I'm evaluating, let's say, it depends on its neighbors. Because if I flip the ambiguity in one of those, that changes my derivative in j. So this is inherently a non-local problem. Like the pixels are coupled together by this finite differencing. So one can do sort of like an iterative approach. You can kind of like start from something and you, you pass this through and flip things and say, if j gets smaller, accept it if you don't. But that tends not to give you the true sort of global minimum. So this method uses simulated annealing, which for those of you who are not familiar with it, it really is based on the concept of annealing metals. It goes back to kind of this idea of you heat something up, you cool it slowly, it, it aligns the grains in the metal essentially. In this case, um, obviously it's not a metal, but we start out with essentially a random set of disambiguation choices and a sequence, we visit a sequence of random pixels at each one, you basically flip the direction of the azimuth see what the change in E is. And then if it decreases, you accept that change. But the annealing part basically says, if it increases, sometimes you also accept it. So it explores a whole lot of parameter space because it doesn't just say, let's march down lower, lower, lower E. It says, sometimes I'm gonna go somewhere higher and see if that gets me to a better location. Um, and then basically what, there's a temperature factor which is controls sort of how likely it is you accept an increase in E. And so the slower that you cool this, the more likely you are to find the global minimum, but the longer that it takes. And apparently there's a theorem which has been proved in simulated annealing that you are guaranteed to find the global minimum in an infinite amount of time, um, which is <laughs> great. My, my colleague quoted this and I made the point is like, well, you can try every possible permutation in a finite amount of time. So it's not really clear that's helpful. But the point of it is that this is a method that's actually fairly robust to having lots of local minima. And so it's a good sort of approach for this where you might actually have a situation where you can have a patch of pixels which all flip together, and we'll actually see some of that later. Um, and that doesn't really change what J or B are because the derivatives turned out to be somewhat, it depends on the stencil that you use, but the finite differences can actually be relatively insensitive to flipping all of the azimuths at the same time. Um, so this is kind of a nice method because it really can get you close to the global minimum, but it is definitely slow. And especially it's slow if you have a large field of view, like lots of pixels and things like that. Um, I'm looking at the DKIS folks now. <laughs> um, in terms of this particular code, there are essentially two parameters that control how slowly you cool this. And basically one says at a given temperature, how many random pixels do I visit? So that's basically saying I'm at fixed temperature and I wanna like sort of explore what happens at that, at that location. And then the other is basically how much do I decrease the temperature at each step? So those are two which you can tune. They're somewhat degenerate in the sense that loosely the overall cooling time gives you most of the sort of benefits of this, but there's a little bit of like sometimes a slightly larger NEQ works better with a smaller T factor and things like that. Yeah. Question is, I should know this and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> temperature, does the temperature determine how many random pixels you Test? What is the temperature? The, in this the temperature context? basically says how often do I accept an increase in E? Oh, that's the probability of. So it's actually it's like the exponent of the change in E over T is the, is what gives you whether you accept it or okay. not. Yeah. And how many pixels you flip is this any Q value? Always... That's independently set. Time to visit. Okay. So you can basically say I want to do like big step down in temperature but at each one, I'm gonna visit pixels many, many times. And typically when you set these values, like any Q will be larger than the total number of pixels you have. Like you visit each pixel more than once, just in some random sequence, because it matters. Like once you flip one, like flipping its neighbor will give you a different result than before you flip the first one. So it actually typically is good to have an any Q, which is like possibly many times the total number of pixels you have. And I, to be sort of full disclosure in this, the way this method actually works in terms of the implementation is that a finite different stencil is basically only neighboring pixels communicate. So in order to be more computationally efficient, the random number generator basically picks an initial pixel. And then from there, it does like every fifth pixel through the whole grid of the, of the area. 
And that means you don't have to compute anywhere near as many random numbers. And random number generation is a not computationally trivial exercise when you're doing it, you know, hundreds of millions of times. So if you can pick up a factor of, you know, sort of like a fifth of the number, or I guess a 25th of the number of pixels that you're going to look at, it makes a big difference. So when we get to this code, this any Q value, you'll see numbers of like 20 or 50 or 100 or something like that. What that actually means is every fifth pixel is being visited that many times. So it's not really that you're only visiting 20 pixels at a given temperature, you're actually visiting many, many more than that. And it's depends on how many pixels there are in total. So this makes it a little bit more kind of like universal in the sense that if I double my field of view, I can use the same any Q value because effectively it's visiting each pixel the same number of times. Anything more on that then? You guys are actually really into the nitty gritty of this, which I wasn't necessarily expecting. <laughs> which is good, because you're going to have to run this in a minute. <laughs> OK, so let's talk for a second about how this method fails. Um, yeah. Well, option one is it doesn't find the global minimum. And that's essentially what we've just been talking about is that to really get down to the global minimum, you have to cool really, really slowly. And most of the time, we don't have the resources to do that on a consistent basis. And at some point, to be honest, it doesn't matter. Like you get down to the point where the last few flipping the pixels is essentially in the noise. And so they're probably not values that you actually care about. So in some sense, it's maybe not super important to find the true global minimum, but you want to get really pretty close to that. Um, but this is sort of a solvable problem in the sense that we can use a couple different random number seeds and we can see if we get the same answer in each pixel. And if you're consistently getting the same answer, then you're probably saying I'm close to the minimum or the, the solution in those pixels is likely to be what it would be in the global minimum. Um, and if it isn't, you can always cool slower. So, you know, this is sort of solvable with some, some thought. The other possibility is, okay, maybe I took an infinite amount of time, I really found the global minimum, but that may not actually be the right answer because this is based on assumptions and approximations in that energy functional that may or may not actually hold for the real sun. And that's not something we can solve within, you know, changing cooling schedules or anything like that. This comes back to, well, some of the questions already came up is, what additional information can we incorporate? And I'm gonna talk, after we play around with this ME0 method, I'm gonna talk more about like some other information that we can put into these methods. And I've already got some ideas from like you guys of like additional things that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, so don't take this as like the completely final answer, but this is a method that essentially you can run on kind of any inversion and you're not relying on having other pieces of information. And then afterwards we'll talk about like what other information might be useful. <clears throat> So let's talk about that first case about not finding the global minimum for a second. Um, what I'm showing here basically is the results of running 10 random number seeds on the same cooling schedule on the same data. Uh, the one on the left has slightly faster cooling, the one on the right has slightly slower cooling. Black says all of the seeds gave me the same answer at that pixel. And then the shades of color are essentially the fraction that, that, that agreed. The contour here is a 200 Gauss in the transverse field. For most of these methods, transverse field is kind of the relevant quantity because that's the thing that's ambiguous. So you often don't really care how strong the line of sight field is in terms of how well the answer comes back. And what you see is that within this contour, there's a lot of black. So the strong transverse field regions have really done pretty well. But in the weaker stuff, you definitely see differences. The main thing I wanna highlight from this is that the areas of difference are smaller when you cool slower. So there's this bright green patch here and then some sort of pinkish stuff off to the side. This is in faster cooling. And that area has now shrunk down to something smaller when I cool slower. So, you know, I'm, I'm being a little hand wave about this. I'm not telling you what the cooling schedules are or anything like that. But I just want to demonstrate that like, there is a way to say, cool slower, you get a more consistent answer. And, and I do, you know, consistent is really the, the technically all you can say. Like, you don't know it's right. You don't even know that it's the global minimum. But it's kind of the best that you can do and say that I'm fairly confident that things are working the way they should. Okay, so I surely should have put summary number one here, but summary up to this point. Um, so this ambiguity is sort of inherent in single height null net engine inversions. And I tried to put that in there carefully because we will talk about obviously the stuff that you guys have been doing and other information. The additional complication being we don't know the answer. So, you know, 
we can come up with the best method possible, but we still don't actually know whether it's working for the sun or not, which is kind of a problem. Um, but we've tested them on you know, cases which are often very simplistic and they still fail there. So you can rule out some methods fairly easily by saying that you know, they just really aren't getting even easy cases right. Um, and typically what we find is these global methods seem to perform better. They're less susceptible to some of the issues of like just little patches that are wrong or sometimes not even little patches. Uh, I put a couple references in here. These are basically write-ups of these two comparison workshops. Um, the second one, if you're interested in spatial resolution, is, is in this Leca et al. paper from 2009. So you can go look at that if, if you want to follow up on it. Um, this minimum energy code in Fortran is available in Peer, and basically that's what was in the Powerball that was distributed for you guys to download. Um, it's basically only in Fortran because it is pretty computationally intensive. Uh, I started playing around with like doing a stripped down version in Python, but I just kind of didn't follow through with that because if you're really gonna do a science problem, you wanna be able to do this sort of like heavy duty lifting type stuff. So um, I'm gonna show you one more slide on running the ME0 code. Then we're gonna switch over to the Jupyter Notebook or what I think what we'll do is probably take a quick break first. Um, just as a note, I don't know if anybody managed to actually compile the code or not. If you didn't, not a problem. I generated some example outputs, so you can just read those in as sort of a proxy for running it yourselves. Um, but I'd like to have people at least sort of like explore, you know, looking at some solutions, getting a feel for some of this differences between cooling schedules and random number seeds and things like that. So in preparation for that, actually, maybe let's do it this way. Let's break, and then I'll talk this through, which is basically one of the inputs to the code. Um, and you can then sort of look at this in the context of the notebook and so forth. So I'm going to say, if we do sort of five-ish minutes now, we'll come back, we'll play with the notebooks for a little bit, we'll take like another five-minute break, and then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about some of the more additional information pieces and things like that, if that works for people. Becca's looking at your watch, you'll see us for 26, okay. <laughs> I think I at least have us as being ready to go again. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to spend like just a minute or two talking about this input parameter file for the ME0 code. Um, and then we'll actually go play around with some of the results from it. So <clears throat> there's a whole lot of, of flags and parameters and things that go into here. Um, a bunch of them, a lot of these ones which have like flag in the name of them, basically are specific to the instrument or the inversion that you're using because some people input things or output things in degrees, some use radians, some choose azimuth angle up as being zero, some to the right is zero. And so it's a whole lot of settings like that that if you wanna go run this code on your own data, you'll have to figure out what the appropriate settings are. And so we tried to make the code flexible in the sense of it's just an input parameter value. You don't have to go in and change like sine to cosine or anything like that. Um, we're not going to worry about that. I just want to make you guys aware that, that some of those things exist. Um, there's some other stuff. This next line here controls how the potential field is computed. So remember that we're using derivatives from the potential field in approximation to div b. Um, the issue, most of this is related to the fact that it uses Fourier transforms to do the computation. Sometimes if you, when you have a limited field of view, you have very strong field right at the edge of your field of view. And FFTs hate that. They tend to get ringing and all kinds of nasty things happen close to the boundary. So there's some stuff in here which has to do with basically adding some padding of zeros and then doing like a smooth taper to zero and things like that. So there's stuff there that has to do with how to make a, a sort of a nice potential field. Um, all those are basically, if you use the defaults, you're probably fine. So the thing I wanna focus on, and we've kind of already talked about this, but there's sort of three parameters in here. There's a random number seed which controls a sequence of random numbers. There's these NEQ and P-factor quantities, which are basically how slow you cool. And those are the kinds of things that you do need to kind of experiment with and when you've got a new data set and particularly combination of looking at different seeds for a given cooling schedule and then maybe adjusting the cooling schedule is the sort of thing that I would do all the time when I'm sort of playing with a new data set. So I thought what we basically could do is have a look at some examples of this and you guys hopefully can get a feel for how changing these matters and whether I'm actually doing kind of a reasonable cooling schedule or not. 
Um, so we'll see something which looks a lot like this in the Jupyter Notebook. I guess if everybody could try and like call that one up now. And I will also switch over to that if I can. So I'm gonna, <laughs> oh, let me ask a question. Is there anybody here who does not have the Jupyter Notebook at this point? Like everybody does, great, okay. So this is more or less, I hope, sort of self-explanatory in terms of their comments in there. So I'm gonna encourage you guys to just go through and see what you get. Basically, there's a few steps like this where it says, you know, run the code. And it sounds like most people were not able to compile it or anything like that. <clears throat> Instead, what you'll see is that there are, typically commented out, but um, there are example files with output already generated. So what I would suggest you do basically is pick some of these examples and you can start plotting them and see what they look like. <clears throat> um, main convention here, basically, this first part about TPD10B is it's just the name of the test case. So it's the same test case that we talked about, test case number three that had the noise added. The B refers to sort of the medium noise level. And then this S3, S stands for seed and you should see values of one through 10 afterwards. So you've got 10 random number seeds to look at. And then there's ones which are just dot dat and ones which are underscore slow cool. So those are two different cooling schedules. And so I'm gonna put it to you basically is, you know, pick a seed, maybe look at a couple different seeds, compare them, and then also compare the slow cool with the regular ones and see what differences you get. And I'm gonna pause there and just let you guys go to it for a minute. Um, and then maybe I'll create a couple of these plots as well. Uh, there's a second case further down, but let's sort of like try this for five minutes or so and see what you get. And I guess my question to you at some level is, is the default cooling, meaning like the non-slow cool good enough or should I have used the slow cool or should we be cooling even slower? So, and, and when someone comes up with an answer, <laughs> tell me why. Why do you think it's either good or bad or, or we need to do even better? I mean, I'm gonna do like five minutes or so and then we'll check in at that point. If anybody has an issue with like running anything, just like stick a hand up and I can try and help debug or whatever, there's stuff that's not working. I guess I'll add, because I've seen a couple people talking. I love the idea of neighbors using different random number seeds and compare what you get, because that may be easier than, you know, like generating a bunch of different ones for yourselves. So just as a thought, feel free to compare with your neighbor.
And when I went to hazard a guest, slow cooling important or did the original cooling schedule look okay? Say again? Important, okay. <laughs> Well, let me ask, has everybody managed to at least get a plot of something and show up or? Okay. Okay. So, okay, so let me put it up. Does anybody want to comment on, or does anyone want to present a reason why Low cool is better or worse than the non slow cool version. And share your screen if you want to show what you're looking at. No one's willing to. I will. I will talk about it. But anyone brave enough to do this? Yeah, you want to go? Uh, I'm not set up on the Zoom, so I can't share my screen. Oh, okay. Um, but with the with the fast cooling, you're very dependent on the random number seed. So you change the set of random numbers, and your solution is changing quite a bit. Uh, but with the slower cooling, the solution is a lot more robust and isn't as dependent on what random noise that you're you're adding in. Great, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's essentially a good check is compare the solutions in different number seeds, see if you get the same answer or not. Um, what I have up here is one of the not slow cool versions. Uh, I'm actually going to say, and this because I've stared at you know thousands of these at this point, even without the random number seed. This looks like a suspicious solution because you see these discontinuities happening, right? You see an abrupt change from sort of like the red end to the blue end, which is like 180 degrees. So this is saying that there's a current sheet of some sort in there. And it's given that the method is trying to get rid of those, things probably didn't go well. The other thing, which is I'm very familiar with, but you see these checkerboard patterns. It's sort of like where the solution alternates back and forth and back and forth. That's basically an artifact of the finite difference in stencil. And it turns out there's sort of like some degeneracies in, in how that's computed. Um, you can use different stencils and you get different patterns. It never really goes away, but you can sort of change what it looks like because it depends on whether you use like three point or four point and all kinds of things like that. Um, so even looking at this to my eye, I can sort of say, I've looked at enough of these, it's got features that I don't like. If, but if you compare the seed, that's the really definitive one of, I definitely didn't find the global solution. Um, I'm going to go back for just a second. I, I was running in real time. This is what you actually would see if you had run the code. Um, most of this is just sort of printing stuff along of the steps complete, the steps complete, and so forth. I just thought I would show that in case anybody wants to use it. But the other thing that's output is a final energy. And that can also be a useful thing to look at because when I cool slower, my expectation is the energy should get lower. That's kind of the point is getting closer to the global minimum. So another way to check some of this is I can also look at the energy values and say, if I cool much slower, but the energy doesn't change that much at the end, then I'm probably not getting much more information out from my solution. I'm sort of at the point where I'm probably in the noise and flipping pixels that don't make a whole lot of difference. So that's another sort of piece of information that can sometimes be used. Um, let me just for completeness sake, hopefully everybody's already looked at one of these, but... Uh, one of the slow cool versions. Um, so, you know, the good news is there isn't that discontinuity showing up here. You do still see some of this checkerboard pattern off in a corner. And you see now a little bit more pronounced, there is this kind of like flipping back and forth between uh, shades in here. And this is the noise. So remember, this is the case where we add the photon noise. This is probably correct in the sense that the ambiguity was chosen right, but the field is wiggling around because of the noise in there. So, Slow cool, in this case, or how I labeled the file, it's okay, but I would probably continue to cool because this to me still looks suspicious. I think if you look at some of the other random number seeds, you'll see that that pattern also sort of shifts around. Like the majority of the solution is consistent, but there's some stuff around the corners that's not so good. All right, how time? All right, so. Maybe what we'll do is go ahead and look at the next case as well. So I didn't run as many random number seeds for this because I figured you guys could sort of play around with the first one. Um, but I'm going to come back to talking about this solution in after we sort of done with the notebook. So there's another set of examples here where, um, again, I, I've 
created the output for you guys to read in. Um, maybe in the interest of time, let me just sort of do some of this and I'll, I'll share, but feel free to kind of like pick a different seed and follow along. Um, this is real data now. Uh, so this is from a Hinode scan. This was a Surin version, which I think you talked about a few days ago. I've lost track of the schedule. Um, this is one particular height. There's actually two heights in this example. So we're kind of moving towards this whole, what happens if I have information along the line of sight or in optical depth and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so this is looking reasonably good in the sense of, again, better to compare the seeds, but what you see is that for the most part, these are all sort of like smooth transitions between colors. So I'm not seeing a lot of like line current type stuff. There's places where like here you see just a little bit of that checkerboard pattern, a little bit up here and here and things like that. But overall, like this isn't looking like a fairly decent solution. Um, for reference, this was actually cooled even slower than the slow cool case in the previous one. So this is where it actually does kind of matter like data set can influence how much cooling you want to, or how slowly you want to do the cooling a little bit. Um, so that's one height. I think I set this up. This is the other height and shrink this down a little bit. We'll see if we can actually get that together. So to I, there's not a whole lot of differences between those two heights. These are normally 100 kilometers apart. So, and they should be sort of within the regime where, you know, server is working pretty well. You're not off. I think, I think you guys were looking at, you know, like crazy large and small optical depths and realizing things kind of go, go haywire out there. So this should be within the regime where things are pretty well determined. Um, but this is also, in some sense, one of the challenges in previewing towards DFV is finite differences. Well, if you're really close together, things don't change very much and you've got noise, your derivatives can also get a little bit unstable. So there's also some trade-offs as we start looking towards this and how far apart in optical depth do I wanna be looking? Um, so just for the end of the notebook here, This is the difference between the azimuth at the two heights. And this is after the disambiguation. So what you see is that there's lots of this kind of like pale blue, which is right around zero. So that's good in the sense of like I'm getting a consistent solution between the two heights. Um, but it also says there isn't a whole lot of difference in the azimuth direction between the two heights. Um, there's areas here where you see this like bright red. That's kind of an artifact in the sense that um, that's, I think, minus 360, essentially. That's where the azimuth at one height is like just below where it wraps and the other is just above where it wraps. So this is effectively not very much different. And I didn't play games with the color table in order to sort of like remove that effect. Um, and then you do see, you know, there's lots of little stuff, differences and things like that. Some of which are probably failures of the ambiguity resolution. Um, so it's not perfect but it does pretty well over kind of most of the, the area there with, with what we've seen. So that's what I kind of had set up for the notebook. Anything you guys want to talk about from that or questions or things like that? Yes, yes. And preview of in about 10 minutes, I'll show you what happens if you try and do them together. Maybe 15. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess I will say like going forward, you know, I'm happy to field questions about like actually getting this code running in Fortran and things like that. I realize it was pretty short notice to get things set up. Um, it is built around the, inter the Intel Fortran compiler. That is partly because there's a set of libraries that are very efficient for doing FFTs and things like that. So we kind of built it into that and it's hard to decouple that from using like a generic G4 train compiler, things like that. Um, I think you guys should all, as students, be able to get free access to the compiler. So if you want to do it, it's possible. Um, and I'm happy to try and like answer questions around that, you know, next week or next month or whatever, if, if you're interested in pursuing this. Um, and I hope there's enough in here to kind of give you a sense of how to run it where you know, this 
third file is kind of like the key to controlling how things run. And there's really just a couple flags in there that kind of you'll have to experiment with. And then a few of these, which like I said, are instrument specific. So you do have to know, you know, what's coming out of your inversion in order to run it appropriately. And if you don't, you'll see some really interesting patterns. I haven't looked at them in this color table, but they're probably particularly psychedelic in that. Okay, I'm gonna switch back to some slides then. And we'll continue on. Okay, so again, the first part of this, I really was trying to talk about the, the majority of these algorithms are designed to run single height, don't need anything else. Let's see what's the best we can do. But there's potentially a number of other pieces of information we can incorporate that aren't necessarily available from every instrument, inversion, whatever kinds of combinations. Um, and I've listed three here. Everybody's excited about number three and I'm saving it for last. Um, so I, wanna, I do wanna talk about some of the other ones first and there's kind of a reason for, for me to do it this way. Um, Gradients in time. So this is a little bit like we talked about that many of these algorithms assume that the spatial variation is relatively smooth on the scales we're looking at. But we also maybe know something about how fast the sun is evolving in time. And so if I have a sequence of magnetograms, I can think about saying, I'm not gonna do each one independently. I'm gonna compare what, what happens from the neighboring ones with the idea that I don't really expect the azimuth to be flipping back and forth between neighboring times. Um, so we'll talk about more of that in just a second. The other possibility is to say, maybe I can look at the same piece of the sun from different points of view. So by and large, we've only had sort of like stuff close to the earth. Um, and the differences haven't really been helpful enough to, to do anything. But with Solar Orbiter, we're starting to get data from different vantage points. And so that's another possibility that, again, definitely not available all the time, but has some potential. And I'll say just a tiny bit more about that in a second. And then this last one we've been talking about quite a lot in passing, um, and we'll finally go into the details of what it means to implement it in practice. So let's look at the time dependence for a second. Um, I'm gonna show you HMI examples because HMI has really nice sort of combination of cadence plus spatial resolution to sort of be appropriate for this. Uh, I do think it's important to recognize like the cadence you want is kind of dependent on the resol spatial resolution you have. So this is kind of the, the same problem, if any of you are familiar with some of the like local correlation tracking algorithms, the optical flow type things is, you know, you don't wanna have things too far separated in time, too much evolution happens relative to the size of the pixel, right? So it kind of matters that combination of the two. And HMI is, is pretty well suited for that. So this is a small piece of active region 11158, which was everybody's favorite active region for a long time. Um, same convention that the red and blue contours are the radial field, arrows showing the direction and magnitude of the horizontal field. Um, what we have here, you can see sort of like positive field here. Generally speaking, field is directed out away from that, the horizontal field. There's some interesting kind of change in polarity here, but you see that the horizontal field is actually pretty smooth through there. Like it just kind of continues to follow out in the same direction. So is this right? Well, I don't know, right? Like it, there's some things that are a little suspicious in terms of how the polarity changes, but the horizontal field actually looks pretty good. So that's one of those ones where it's like, well, this could be a global minimum that doesn't correspond to the right answer, or we, maybe we didn't find the right, the right global minimum, or maybe that's really what it is. Um, so let's look at 12 minutes later. Get a totally different answer. Whole area of that change in polarity is gone. That real? Probably not. Like, and, and this is one where we kind of do know what the sun does because at the center, you can look at the line of sight component and you don't see it flip-flopping back and forth in 12 minute cadence. Um, so we're reasonably confident that like the radial field shouldn't change like that. Uh, so this is a case where one of these solutions is almost certainly wrong. Um, I might argue that this is the nicer looking one because like the radial component looks pretty good. The horizontal component, there's a few arrows that are kind of pointing in pretty different directions, but by and large, it's still a fairly smooth solution. So maybe that's not such a, a bad indication that this is a more likely answer. So I've got a tool for this. I've got my simulated annealing, and basically I can do a similar thing to what we were doing before in terms of minimizing a functional, 
but I'm going to add a term. So this is the piece that we were looking at before, div b plus j. Now I've explicitly put in that there's some time dependence here, and we're going to sum over the times. But then we can add another piece, which is basically the change in the field between one time and the next. And we're basically going to say, we want this to also be small. We don't want things to flip flop back and forth in time. So now I can do an optimization, which says, div b, in, the approximation to div b should be small. I don't want to have current sheets, and I don't want to see a whole lot of really rapid evolution of the field. Um, I sort of split this one out so you could see it, but basically, you know, this difference comes down to b e squared at the two different times. That's not ambiguous. That's just the magnitude of the field. And then this piece, which is like the dot product between the two. So you can see that if I flip the direction of one of these, I'm going to go from something which is, you know, assuming they're relatively aligned or counterlined, something which is fairly large versus something which is fairly large and negative. And let's take a look at what happens if we do that. So this is the same pipeline solution. This is the later time. I'm going to, I'm going to go sort of backwards in time now. So again, this is the area where no obvious polarity change. Solution looks fairly reasonable. Here's the same thing if I impose that time consistency piece. And it, I'll flip back and forth in a second, but you know, no polarity change in here. There are some details of differences out in here, for example. So if we go back and forth, they're definitely not the same, but you don't see that huge flip going on right in here. So the time consistent solution has found yet another, a third option if you like, but it's fairly close to the one at this later time. Here's what the time consistent solution looks like at the earlier time. And it's found the solution with no flip in polarity. So if I go back and forth on time consistency ones, well, the time consistency really worked, right? Like there just isn't all that much change between the two different times. And that's good. I mean, we still may not have the right answer, but there's reasons to say that this is maybe the more likely solution of the two. And just for completeness, this is the earlier time, time consistent solution, earlier time from the pipeline. And we're back to that polarity flip. So adding this time consistency piece seems to be actually like a fairly useful additional piece of information. And it's what's interesting, still don't know if it's right or not, but again, this little area up in here, um, what you see is that it's different between time consistent and regular pipeline standalone but the two times consistent solutions are actually pretty similar up there. So it's not just in the sort of suspicious area that's found a different solution. It's found different solutions in other areas too. And maybe that's a sign that, that that's actually a better answer. Um, part of the thing about this is HMI specific, right? HMI gives us 12 minute cadence pretty much all the time. So this run was not actually just these two frames. This was time consistency over like 24 hours. And that's nice because it basically says that I'm, if I just look at two frames, I really don't have all that much information other than they should match. But if I can track the evolution of something over a long time period, then I have a better chance of saying, okay, at some point in there, you know, the, the answer was easy and then it evolved. And so if I can track that evolution from something that was fairly easy to identify what was right, I'm more likely to end up stuck in the right, the right solution. So, I would say for the appropriate instrument, this is a really useful thing to add. But again, you have to have the appropriate combination of resolution, time, trade-off, and it's not always going to be available. Questions or comments on that? Multiple vantage points. Um, I'm not really going to talk about this. Uh, mostly I put this in because I wanted to stick in a reference to uh, work by Valori et al. So they spent quite a lot of time thinking about this really carefully. And as any aspects of disambiguation, in principle, it sounds really easy and in practice to do it well is not that easy. And so I just point you guys towards like this paper if you wanna look at the details of it. Part of the issue is that, you know, it depends on how separated the vantage points are. And so there's certain areas where you're just not gonna get enough information out depending on what it is that you're looking at. But there's also, Sort of subtle differences that, you know, depending on where you're looking on the disk, you can be observing different heights. And so you're not actually looking at the same piece of sun. The field is not actually the same. You hope that because, again, we're picking between two very different solutions, it doesn't matter in terms of picking the right one. But it's not really as simple as just saying, 
oh, one is going to exactly match and one is going to be totally different. It's more like I need to pick the one which is closest. Um, and so this study basically, I believe what they did is they took uh, a simulation and then they used a essentially like a forward model to simulate what P is going to be seen or is seen, um, and then try to actually look at some of the instrumental effects and things as well. So I think this is super promising, but obviously very limited because we don't get observations from different vantage points, or at least sufficiently different vantage points very often. I guess I should say, and also not too different, right? Because it doesn't help if he's looking at the far side of the sun, we have to actually be looking at the same path to sun. <clears throat> but the thing I also like about this is that it may be, we know what the answer is. So we can test some of the other methods and say, okay, for those times when we're looking at the same piece of sun from two vantage points, I can use this stereoscopic method and say, I'm really pretty confident this is what the answer should be. Now, what do all the other methods that don't use the stereoscopic approach tell me? Can we learn something from that? Are we, are we actually getting things done well or not? So I think this is kind of a stay tuned, let's see what happens, um, but very encouraging. Okay, the part you've all been waiting for, <laughs> or at least some of you. Why did it take so long to do this? Why didn't we just sort of start with div b equals zero? You've been spending two weeks figuring out how to get you know, information in tau and all the rest of it. And it's not as straightforward as it seems. And there's a couple of reasons around that. Um, the first one is what we really want to compute div b are vertical gradients in space, right? What you're typically getting from an inversion is a gradient in tau. So you have to both map between sort of tau and physical distance, but you also have to worry about the fact that line of sight is not vertical. And so there's a couple different sort of pieces that go into this mapping between tau and z. Most of the people in this room are probably way better qualified than I am to talk about the differences between basically optical depth and a physical distance. So I'm gonna just highlight a little bit the fact that you also have to worry about the direction of things. Um, and then the other piece, which we'll talk more about is that you still have to do horizontal derivatives. So this is still not a local problem in the sense that just knowing d, 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 z, d, z isn't enough. And to compute the d, d, x piece or d, d, x, d, d, y pieces, you also have to worry about the fact that neighboring pixels talk to each other. And then what are we measuring anyway? And I'll come to that in a minute. So it be looks simple, right? I mean, especially if I write it in Cartesian components. Um, I purposely put the Z term here first because it's gonna be a little bit uh, of a mess. I'm gonna express it separately. So this is, and I explicitly put H's on these to say heliographic, meaning this is vertical, these are horizontal components and, and coordinates. But what I measure is something more like this. So here's the DBZ, DZ term, and I've written it out here in terms of things we actually were looking at. This is dbx, dx, this is dby, dy, written in terms of image components of the field and horizontal derivatives. So again, we don't get the horizontal components of the field, we get like transverse and line of sight. So that matters. Um, this A matrix, these are basically just coordinate transform things. So as long as I know where my telescope's pointing, that's known, we can deal with that. And they're just, I mean, you can worry about what you're gonna do spatial, like spherical geometry and things like that, but at least locally, those are straightforward. Um, so these are all horizontal derivatives, a finite difference, but I can do them. But notice that, you know, dx include, dx heliographic includes component contributions from all three of the image components. So it, it's a mix of the blue are the things that are ambiguous, the black are the ones that are not in the components. P is even more complicated because I have, in addition to the fact that the horizontal, or the Heliographic components of DZ is a mix of all of the image components. This vertical derivative is a mix of image derivatives and horizontal derivatives. What this means is when I actually write out div B in terms of things that I know from an inversion, or at least are reasonably easy to infer from the inversion, it involves kind of all the permutations of everything. You've got horizontal derivatives of ambiguous and not ambiguous components. You've got line of sight gradients of not just B line of sight, but also of ambiguous things. So in fact, this is a whole host of different things all combined together. Now, in some sense, it's not a problem. It's straightforward to write it down. Um, but it does mean that as an optimization problem, 
it's kind of computationally intensive because when you flip that azimuth, you're actually changing a whole lot of different terms in here. And so you have to keep track of the impact on, on everything. And again, because the horizontal derivative is not local. But having said that, <clears throat> I got a framework for doing this. So I got this minimum energy method. I can drop this in and essentially just work out for every, when I change the solution, <clears throat> the ambiguity solution at a given point, I work out what the change in energy is due to all of this and I can feed it in and see what happens. So oh, unfortunately I didn't update the color tables. This is what we were just looking at in the Jupyter notebook. So on the right hand side, these are the two heights that we had. This is the azimuth angle. This black to white transition is because I didn't use a cyclic color table, so that's not an issue. But what you see is that, again, pretty smooth solution over most of it. There's stuff out in the edges here, which is probably relatively noisy. Again, we saw some little examples of like checkerboards and things going on there. Plausible solution, we already kind of knew that. This is the two heights done independently using ME0. These are the two heights if I just minimize div B given the information on the previous page. And what you see is it's a mess. Or Kajana maybe like it because there's lots of current sheets in here. Uh, but this is basically photosphere. So we don't really expect there to be this kind of structure. What you see, in fact, is you know all kinds of craziness at both heights, and they don't even necessarily match up between the two heights. So this is kind of like the naive implementation of I just minimize that div B thing that I had before based on sort of my best knowledge of what's going on. And it doesn't look good. Why? So what I'm showing here, let's maybe let's start with the right-hand plot. The horizontal axis is the horizontal gradient of dh. Vertical axis in this right plot is dz potential dz. So it's the thing that I put into me zero. And if div b is zero, you should see all the points along this x equals minus y line. Basically, if I add them together, they should cancel. And sure enough, there's, I mean, there's some scatter, but that's pretty much what you see is that things lie along that line fairly close. Um, and that matches the solution looks pretty good, right? Like things kind of work. These two, well, the middle panel is what happens if I take, so to compute DB with the horizontal gradient of DH, I have to have done the ambiguity resolution, right? So this middle panel is if I take the solution from ME zero from the single height, but I feed it into that expression for dbzd using sort of all of, all of the pieces in, of um, line of sight and all the other derivatives. So horizontal axis, same thing. Vertical axis, dbzdz, not potential field, but done from finite difference in the two heights where I have used the two solutions from the single height disambiguation. And there's, you know, good correlation, but it doesn't by any means follow the x equals minus y log. And if I go to the case where I try to simultaneously disambiguate both heights, where I basically take all the information from if b only, and I don't try to put in potential field or anything like that, what you see is that there's still some of the same kind of trend, but then there's all these extra points which are kind of actually falling closer to the x equals minus y log. And what that's saying basically is, well, the code is really trying to minimize what it thinks div b is. And how does it do that? Well, it says, guess what? The horizontal gradients aren't big enough. How do I get big horizontal gradients? I introduce discontinuity. So what you see is that this solution is an attempt to get larger horizontal gradients out. So the method is doing its best to say, this is what div b should be. It should be zero, it should be small. But what it ends up doing is introducing all kinds of craziness to the solutions. So I, well, one, I don't necessarily feel like I'm the best person to talk about it, but I will point people to a summary here. Um, this is not new. People have, ha have realized that there's an issue related to horizontal versus vertical gradients. And it's still, I think, kind of an unknown what's going on. Um, there's some interesting, speculations around it. And I'm not gonna say like one of these is right or anything like that. Uh, Veronique Bonnier has put forward that, for example, what we're actually sensitive to in spectral polarimetry is not B, it's H. And we have to worry about the difference between B and H. So in fact, what I'm showing may not be div B, it may be div H, which doesn't have to be zero. 
Um, again, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just like, there are some speculations as to, and I'd love people here if they have you know, more information than I do around it, because this is not really my expertise. Um, but there's also some observations, radio observations from the limb, where you, you really can get DDZ information by looking at how things vary in the plane of the sky. And they seem to be consistent with some of these horizontal gradients. So there's some really kind of interesting stuff going on here. And as a way to do disambiguation, it's kind of a failure, right? Like the solution we get doesn't really look like what we think should be going on in the photosphere. But this whole like, you know, thing you think of as a tool, like how do we get to the radial component of the field, which I can do other interesting physics with, maybe still has some interesting physics of its own. So summary number two, the first couple of bullets are the same kind of thing, but I'll just sort of remind you, most of what we talked about basically was ambiguity where I have single height. It's inherently sort of unresolvable in that layer without making some additional approximations or assumptions. It's hard because we don't know the answer, but maybe we will know the answer from multi-vantage point. Um, we can add some additional constraints. The time consistency thing seems like it's really a helpful thing to do. The multi-vantage in principle looks good, but we don't really have the data to do much of that yet. So kind of a question mark. And then the one that you think would be really helpful in terms of information from these great inversion codes, there's things we don't understand. And it seems like it's just not working. So I will leave it at that. Fun silence. This is where I expected the senior scientists to jump in and either explain to me what's going on or have questions about it. <laughs> Because we you recently implemented the uh, minimum energy algorithm in the Hinode pipeline, and we know that the Hinode data have, um, let's say, inaccuracies in the pointing keywords in the pitch headers. And I was wondering what your opinion was on um, the effect down the line of on the retrieved disambiguated quantities. I know that, you know, sometimes when the you know, point in information is off the limb when you have data or on this, when you have no intensity, but the code crashes. But that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking about the inaccuracies that result in the derived yeah. quantities. Let me, let me do a little bit of background for the sake of the students and things. Um, have you talked about the Hinode pipeline in here in terms of not much. Or... Not really. No, okay. that was not the focus of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of some of it they might they might know about. It's a Milner inversion code that does inversions on the Hinode data routinely, and that is our level two data product is inversion results from that. Uh, but specifically, and nothing to do with the inversions, the headers of each one of the Hinode um, spectrophotometer files have a lot of information about telescope pointing, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that that telescope point and information has inaccuracies of multiple arc seconds, and that depends where you are on the disk. So sometimes at the poles, the inaccuracies are larger, and they might tell you that you're on disk when you're actually off the limb for a given pixel and, and stuff like that. But I mean, they're of the order of tens of arc seconds in general. And, and I would add they're time dependent as well. So you see variations through the year, and you also see variations through like mission of Hinode. So it gets yeah. worse. The, more the eclipse data. season are the worst, like right? during eclipse, Hinode eclipse yeah. season, the inaccuracies are huge compared to out of eclipse season, for instance. And there's some interesting, I'll come back to the disintegration in just a second, but just uh, there's some interesting aspects to this as well, because it's a systematic bias. Basically, the shift you need to make is always, I may get this backwards, but it's always like to the right and up, and it's just a question of how much. And that actually makes a really surprising difference to some things like if you're interested in things like the total current, you end up actually having hemispheric biases because you're always moving things one way relative to where they should be. So this turns out to be surprisingly impactful for science you might want to do, even if the disambiguation was perfect. Um, but to Rebecca's question around this particular impact, we looked at, well, let me back up, the, there's, there's a level 2.1 product for, from the pipeline, which are basically are the heliographic components of the field. So let, you know, like, let me just talk about BR. And 
there's sort of two impacts from this. One is literally, you know, I got the pointing wrong. I don't change the disambiguation, but BR changes because I'm at a different location than I thought I was. Then there's the fact that the disambiguation can also change based on the fact that I was computing something wrong. And they're both important effects at some level. The difference is basically what field strength you look at. So the effect tends to be sort of more pronounced in certain field strength ranges in one case than in the other. And also it depends on, like you were saying, like where you are in the disk. So if you're at disk center, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference because shifting things like a fixed number of arc seconds doesn't change the latitude you're at by very much. Latitude you're at by very much. Um, but when you're close to the limb pole or, or east-west limb, it makes a really big difference. Um, so you can make the argument the disambiguation should be rerun. I think in principle, it's probably not, uh, I mean, I'd love to, <laughs> um, but it's more impactful at some of the sort of like few hundred Gauss transverse fields, which maybe are less in interest to a lot of people. Um, but it definitely does give you a different solution. Part of the issue though, is that it's a pipeline. We couldn't cool as slow as we'd like to because we actually needed to do this in a reasonable amount of time. And so if you also compare the difference between random number seeds, it has a similar impact to changing the pointing in a lot of cases. So there's also an issue there, which is a, okay, on average, we're probably getting a better answer but any individual pixel is a little bit of a toss up because sometimes we got the answer wrong in the news disambiguation or right in the previous one, just because of this, the randomness of the cooling process. So yeah, not, not clear cut, I guess is sort of the answer. But... Yeah, I'm sorry. It's not, yeah, it, it's not crazy far out there, like throughout every science result you've ever seen kind of thing. Um, So I, I will say the place this is probably most impactful are polar scans because they tend to be kind of like the weaker or well, we can argue about field strength versus field factor and all the rest of it and Tenodi and things like that. But, but in the context of the disambiguation, they're probably in a regime where it matters more and you're close to the pole where like the Torda transform matters more. And I don't think people have the community at large has made use of those polar scans as much as they should or could because polar fields are huge for people who do global models and things like that. And so this is a kind of an underutilized resource from, from my perspective. And it would be great if we could get higher quality polar field measurements. So I'll, I'll plug this a little bit. Um, some of this came out of a machine learning project on trying to basically create a high quality Inode level 2.1 data set as an answer for training machine learning on HMI IQV. It was basically, could we emulate Hinode from HMI? And the machine learning folks are great at co-alignment stuff. So they kind of went to town on this and one of them came back and was like, you guys know like there's a systematic offset, right? And we all went, what? <laughs> um, and so this has actually just been submitted as a, Here's what this looks like. I don't think I have anything to show off the top of my head, but if people are interested, I can certainly dig that out. And one can either, because we essentially always have an HMI scan for every Hinode scan since HMI launched, you know, you can basically do the corrections and tabulate them. But there's also a relatively simple sort of functional form, which like Rebecca said, there's eclipse season, which you see this kind of big bike is the wrong word because it's not, it's not sharp, but it's larger magnitude. And then there's sort of like a longer term trend. The best I understand it, and you mean more than I do, is that 
the R that mounts SP is like slowly separating from another part of the spacecraft. And there's a thermal piece from the eclipse season which causes it to do this on top of like the slow moving apart. I think that's plausible at least. Um, so it seems like it's kind of a hardware temperature issue is probably the underlying cause. And I think it's actually seen in some of the other instruments on Hinode as well. Like you see not necessarily the same pattern, but there is a eclipse season plus lifetime of spacecraft dependence. But that was way far off of this situation, but maybe interesting to people anyway. It does, yeah, yeah. Other questions or comments or? The, the workshops where you try to to represent yeah. um yeah something like this have you those were like 15 years ago or something right? have you tried like to do it again but with more modern simulations uh, that we have nowadays you know at higher resolution so that would approach in principle what the kids will observe there's been no subsequent workshop comparisons for sure, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, I think there have been some individual attempts, not even that recently in terms of, like certainly nothing VCAST related. Um, I mean, we tried with all of these to be, well, I shouldn't say that. the first workshop, we really just put in very simple fields and sort of said, forget instruments or whatever, like we're just gonna sort of like do the real basic thing. And then the second workshop, we tried to focus on some more, maybe instrumentalism is the right word, but like noise effects, resolution effects, things that you have to deal with when you're really observing the field rather than lifting it from a simulation. Um, but I don't think anybody has tried to like do DKIST as the observation you're trying to model. So I don't think anyone's tried that. Um, be great to do. Yeah. Um, there I was- I say with some Muram, Muram snapshots and, and the like, and that yeah. kind of improved the resolution that we- yeah. and access nowadays. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do I make a motion for an early coffee break? <laughs> Seconded, <laughs> all in favor? <laughs> Uh, second 55 minutes, which are coming after the lunch, we're going to look at something else. We're going to look at a map uh, that exhibits uh, helium-1030 polarization, which is mostly due to Zeeman effect. But you will see that helium-1030 also occurs around uh, sunspots and th that you can use it to diagnose some things. And for that data, you can also play. You will see that it's fairly easy to, to invert. But I will show you some uh, weird examples in that data. And I will also show you we won't really have time to do it because we don't have a powerful computer here, here, but I will walk you through a very simple script that is also available on my GitHub in another package that will allow you to prepare that data for parallel processing and to basically run that parallel processing with, with just one command and to invert a lot of pixels simultaneously and uh, so on and so on. But uh, step by step, let's now see what we have here. So I'm going to start from the very beginning. I'm in my folder here there is a notebook called Hanle single profile inversion so we're going to open that book that notebook right now oh, again I didn't turn on my my environment but uh, Nancy taught me that I can change environment here right I know but it's only works in uh, okay Jupiter lab okay, but I don't like Jupiter lab then do it here yeah Uh, the other ones oh yeah and instead of the last uh, uh, last slot won't be exercises but I will give you another little presentation about applications and state of 
the art in Conlay effect and so on and so on. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. See, okay, so first I import all the things. Uh, I want to make it also broader that I forgot to add here. Let's copy paste that uh, from a different one. From uh, this one. This is just a visual um, visual thing to make things bigger, a bit more necessary, larger. Yeah. And I'm also gonna make font a little bit larger. All right, good. Okay, so no, now we're gonna look at the, Right, right. Cool. So now what you want to do is you want to locate this tip single profiles folder. Okay. In my computer, it is in downloads. Data. Data. about this I, it seems like I, I deleted it after uploading it for you guys this is, this is embarrassing okay if you have it you can go and open it I'll just take a moment to to, to find it okay, I need to download it from our from our folder this real quick no no it's supposed to be it should have been linked uh, through a folder that uh, Rebecca sent you I think two days ago don't have the link I can share my link uh, again it's on the website okay this is it, it might not be the same folder that I'm downloading this because this is for my uh, for my personal uh, yeah uh, yeah Sorry about that. Download it. Extract. I'll extract this. Oh, okay. Let's see what might have happened. Uh, oh no, here they were. Okay, they were here all along. Oh, my bad. So for me, they are in data. Tip single profiles. Let's see what's actually in there. There are some files that we don't know what they are right now, but if you open them in text editor, you will see that these are just series of numbers. And these numbers are actually going to be wavelengths and then Stokes I, Q, U, V, and then estimated noise in Stokes I, Q, U, V. And we can see that the noise here estimated is quite, quite low. So let's load all that from our Jupyter notebook. Uh, and I want to do number one first. Okay, so I'm gonna do this skip rows equals one. What does that do? That skips the uh, first, num first uh, line, which only lists the number of valent points. So when I do that, Um, because it's not data, it's data SP 2022. Okay, and then I do data shape. It has nine co nine columns, right? And these nine columns, first one is the wavelength. Wavelength is calculated with respect to 10829.09. And, and the next four are Stokes components. The next four after that is noise for each of Stokes components. What I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna plot these and I'm gonna get something like this. So let's talk about this for a little while. 
what we see here. So first of all, this is, uh, I will just do one real quick uh, PLC type layout to make our plot a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Okay, so what do we have here? Can somebody tell me? What would you estimate this object is? judging from its spectrum and what kind of polarization we see here. Does anybody want to tell me? This is definitely 10 30 line only. We don't see anything else. What object could this be? Filament. Yes, exactly. This is something, probably something like a filament. One thing that is a little bit tricky is that spectral line is really deep, right? And the intensity is a little bit saturated here in the bottom of the line. What does this tell you about the filament? The optically thick, exactly. So we didn't really play much with the optical thickness of our objects. If, we'd, if, if we had, we would have seen that the intensity pretty much plateaus like this when we have a, when we have a high optical thickness. And so we, we will expect here that when we fit this data, that we will get some relatively high optical thickness, which is which is fine. Okay, I'm already anticipating problems in fitting, uh, in in getting the line depth correct because you know 0 0.3 depth or 0 0.4 depth is quite quite deep. So we might have to put our filament very high above the sun in order to obtain a low enough source function, or we might have to maybe even fit for this beta parameter. This is why we are here to play with this kind of thing. Stokes Q and Stokes U, what do we think about them? Very low polarization, right? For starters, this is like what under 1%. And for Stokes U, it's we 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 barely see it. Well, I would personally say that this is definitely scattering polarization. How do I know? This is something that we didn't focus on yesterday, but you might have noticed it. How do I know that this is almost surely scattering polarization? Did anybody notice that the blue component and the red component has opposite linear polarization yesterday when we were playing with it? Yes. The reason for that is a very obscure reason. I skimped over some line properties, but there is a specific line property and we will mention it today in the afternoon, which is called intrinsic line polarizability. That is like a, that's like a, a lambda factor for scattering polarization in a way i like to think about it that way it's a number which is you know for for its ideal zeman uh, zeman triplet it's around one it can be smaller than one or maybe even larger than one for some spectral lines and it tells you how much this specific combination of your upper and lower level j's and m's and so on and s's is susceptible to linear polarization. So it's a number that multiplies in a, in a simplest possible way. You can think about it as a number that multiplies amount of scattering polarization in order to convert classical case to the quantum case. In this case, for the blue component, that intrinsic line polarizability, typically the, denoted by W2, is smaller than zero. And, that's, and in the red components, it's larger than zero. So that is why they are of the opposite sign. For it, these intrinsic line polarizabilities have nothing to do with Zeman effect. So if this was a linear polarization due to Zeman effect, I would know, I would see them of the same sign, right? Here I see them of the, of the opposite sign because of the intrinsic line polarizability. Why do I need to know that? Well, there are multiple reasons. First of all, you should know what you're looking at. You should have some vague idea about what's going on already by looking at your data. The other one is that I now know that I need to like, how strong magnetic fields I'm expecting, how big bounder is to make for my parameters and so on and so on, right. For the Stokes uh, U, we don't really have much information, but there is a little bit of something happening here, right? And then finally for Stokes V, there is one thing that is gonna create us a pain. And that is the fact that Stokes V here, at least in the strong line, seems to be a little bit asymmetric, right? and also very narrow here in this negative lobe here. Okay, this is not the first time that you have seen asymmetric Stokes V, Stokes v profiles. For SIR, for DESIRE, asymmetric Stokes V profile is not a problem. What does it indicate? Gradients in velocity and, and, and magnetic field. Why is it a problem for us? 
You only have one slab, which has one velocity, one magnetic field, there are no gradients, right? So if you were really super determined to fit this with a multi-component model, you could, you could maybe reproduce this. However, the Stokes I here is so nice and so tame and so beautiful that it almost seems like there is no need for the multi-component model. Of course, I encourage you to try later and maybe if, if you know this goes really fast and smooth or you are bored, we can just sit and try to do some, some crazy stuff with multi-component models. Okay, good. We kind of know what we need to do. So in principle, even if I didn't give you this notebook, you could just copy paste stuff from the, uh, from the yesterday's notebooks. So I'm just gonna jump through uh, our three important steps that we were doing yesterday. One is save your Valen file. The next one is save your weights file. And the next one is save your profile together with the noise, right? Now, be careful, don't just run this one because here it's optimized for some other, you know, uh, uh, for some other viewing geometry and so on. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna change the, uh, I'm gonna change this to this center position. So this is the center position, zero, zero. And this thing here, I need to change boundary condition to one, right? Like we don't know, I have to tell you, right? We don't have image in order to see where we are on the, on the disc. So for this one, I'm just gonna tell you where we, where we are, okay, right? But I can kind of see that I'm at the disc center because my intensity here is one and you know, absorption is very strong and so on. So good, so let's run this. And then also don't run the next one. You will get an error because this config file doesn't exist, okay? We're gonna make this config file now. So switch back to your terminal. And let's, uh, let's see that there is a general file called confini. I'm gonna create a copy of it. Confini into conf test. Actually, let's just call it conf A1. Here, I'm going to change the name into conf A1, and let's edit that one. So here, there is a lot of things that were before. Let's just let, let's just change it. The simplest possible way for us is to have two cycles, right? We're going to put it in the output A1. Uh, our Topology, our spectrum is very simple from 1030. This doesn't matter because this is going to get changed. So you don't have to worry about this. Topology is chromosphere, right? Stokes weights, 111. These are the general ones. Line of sight, I'm going to change this. I'm assuming that it's like this, right? Just because this is an example, but in principle, this last number could be anything. This is our boundary condition as it was. I'm going to add. I have some, some comments, don't worry about them. This is our valent file. Let's see if, the, if we named them correctly. So valent was called 1030A valent. Okay, I'm gonna change that here. Don't just run through things, otherwise you might get, get some really, uh, uh, really wild things. Let's go. Copy, copy, copy this one here, right? And also, there should be weights file that somehow got deleted from this. Deletion from that wavelength weight file. Weight file is this one here. Good. Here, let's uh, undo everything that I have did before and let's try and fit in the simplest possible way. Since we are on the disk, what I would suggest is we first fit only Stokes I and then in the next cycle, we fit I, Q, U, and V. Then later we can try and play what happens if we change uh, the, for example, the weights of Q and U a little bit more than Stokes V. Then we have this thing with the chromosphere. 
for starters, let's leave the height at this, you know, generic three arc seconds. Later, we're going to increase it. I think we're going to see troubles with three arc seconds. Line is 10, 8, 30. Here for magnetic field, we can put a little bit larger range. Let's put from minus 500 to 500, even though we expect, um, you know, small, small regions. Let's make sure that for tau, we have a lot of flexibility because tau here can be, can be significantly large. Right, velocity, I'm also going to increase this, even though we don't really expect huge velocities. Delta V is fine. Beta, we can try even to, to, to fit beta, and so on and so on, right? And then what am I fitting here? In the first one, I'm fitting tau V delta V A, like before. In the second one, I'm going to fit uh, everything except beta and filling factor. Might work, might not work, but uh, we are here to see, right? And I'm going to set these ones to zero. Keep in mind that in principle here, you have four cycles that are given as an example, but I think the code will work even if you have 10 cycles for some reason. You typically won't need them. So, okay, good. So we set this up. We are now here working mode inversion. Verbose, we said we prefer two to just get the chi-squares. And uh, randomization, we're going to do one randomization. Actually, we can do it this way. Yeah, I, I like it. We put here, we create now a variable called and randomizations in case that later we want to visualize it and we see what happens. Okay, so something is happening. Code is doing something, churning through the data. Chi square is decreasing. Keep in mind that our chi square is much, much larger here. It's, it's like 2000, quite, quite large chi square. Now it's again around 2000 and now the code kind of converged. Okay, Let's see what we get. Keep in mind that in the next one, you need to change it according to what we put here. So we called it output A1 H5. Cool. Let's call it output A1 H5. Nice. I'm going to copy the context of the Stokes file in the fit and I'm first going to examine the, the fit. Cool. Nice, I have one for one randomization, four for four Stokes parameters, 81. And then in the next, uh, in the next cell, what I'm doing is I'm plotting, uh, I'm basically comparing them, right? I have multiple subplots, I'm plotting Stokes to fit and I'm plotting fit for all the possible randomizations. I'm already anticipating that we will maybe use more than one randomization. Gonna do it. Okay, not really good, right? Not great. Not terrible either. The code has some idea what it needs to do, but it's not really doing a good job, right? Okay, so let's see what is happening happening here. Just want to look at one thing. And. Uh, So we have one big problem, which I'm not sure why it happened right now. We'll have to investigate it, which is that the Stokes I in the observation suddenly dropped below one, right? That's one thing that we need to see why did this happen. Then we see that our Stokes Q cannot be fit. Simply the amplitude is not too high. And here we see that our line is not deep enough. And here we see that also Stokes U cannot be fit and Stokes V is kind of happy, okay? So now we could investigate our parameters, but I somehow feel that they are wrong. And I think you agree with me in the, in the sense that they are wrong. Does anybody have an idea why is our Stokes Q not high enough? What I can change in order to remedy this? I can put it higher, exactly. So height, in, in, first of all, I, I see two, uh, you know, Suspicious details here that indicate that height might have something to do with this. The first one is the depth of the line is not good. Okay. Uh, so I can make it, I can fix that by putting my slab higher. If my slab is higher, source function is smaller because there is, uh, it's illuminated from a smaller cone. So the line is going to be deeper. The other, it will also maybe help with the linear polarization here because if the cone is smaller, anisotropy is higher and uh, uh, the Stokes Q is gonna be stronger. So we're gonna change these two things. The other one, that, which probably has to do with something else is the fact that this uh, intensity here is not good. So let's try and fix that 
the first, uh, you know, problem could be that maybe in the uh, config file, we messed up something with the angle. No, that's okay. Angle is good here. So what is the problem? Why is our intensity not peaking at one? Let's go back to the original observations. Here it seems to be peaking at one, right? What is the problem? Uh -huh. Oh, sorry, I was working on something else and there was this line here. So here I multiplied it by something I will explain to you later why, why I multiplied this by this. So let's delete this. Let's run the file again. So write down the intensity again. Let's go to the config file. Let's increase height. Does anybody want to take a wild guess what height do we need? Hmm? Let's try 20 this time. 20 is like what? 15,000, right? Kilometers, a little bit more. And let's rerun the inversion. Oh, the version, of course, doesn't like that our file is not closed. Let's delete the file real quick. I hate this. Put it. Showing um, you how to do something again. Okay, let's put it here. Let's uh, remove this. Okay, nice. Now our inversion should be working. And let's go. Okay. Chi square was like 2000 something. Let's see now. Now is a little bit better. One, 190, 190, dropping a little bit more down. Okay. And here it's also dropping a little bit down. It's pretty huge. I will ask you later why do you think that chi square is so huge? Okay. Good. Let's open it again. Let's plot. plot. Ah, yeah. Uh, okay, my bad again. What what did I do wrong now? Can somebody tell me? Uh, it's not too high. Why is this bad again? It, it's completely co coding wise. It's not. I rewrote numbers and I deleted this line, but I didn't actually recalculate the values of the stokes before writing them down. So this is one big problem with the notebooks is that you are executing fractions of the code, right? But we see here that now our polarization is higher. Our line has nice depth and uh, it, we are kind of going in the, in, the, in the good direction. Also, one thing that I'm gonna do here is, so first of all, I'm gonna restart this. I'm gonna load the data, do this again, do this again, and write it down again. But then in the config file, I actually don't think I will fit for Stokes I in the second cycle. Okay. I will try not to do that. Why will I try not to do that? Because I already have a hunch by looking at the values of the chi square here that in the first cycle, I got chi square around 1900. And then in the second cycle, which encompasses all the Stokes I, it didn't really drop down. So somehow I have a hunch that. Stokes I is dominating my chi-square, and I want to eliminate that. I want to fit only the Stokes parameters in the second cycle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this configuration. I'm going to leave this at QNV. That looks nice. And also, I'm not going to meddle with my optical depth, with my line broadening, and with my line damping anymore. I also can remove velocity for now. So now we are in the in the pretty much the regime that we worked with yesterday. We first fit for thermodynamic parameters, and we from only Stokes I, and then we fit for the remaining with the uh, from the polarized components. Okay, good. So now we're going to see if this works a little bit better. Uh, let's remember that I need to delete my output again. You can also just close it. You don't have to delete it, and let's rerun the inversion again. Okay. Now, chi square dropping, 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 dropping. A19, 19, 19. Okay, it doesn't work. And now look at the Stokes. It, it's four point something. Okay, we'll have to, to meddle with this maybe a little bit more in order to see if it's working. 
hope that now it's good. Oh my God, what is with the data? <laughs> Why did I, uh, what did I mess up? Does anybody know? Rerun this. One, two, three, four, five. Data is here. I'm not gonna change anything here and I'm gonna open my, my actual file with the, the profile to make sure that it's, um, it's good. Here. Still at 8.8. .8. I don't like that. What is the problem? I could. I could also just delete this file. I want to see what is the problem. So this is here called Stokes. This one, what is it writing? It's writing, aha, uh -huh, Stokes to fit. Ah, okay. There is a problem. There is Stokes to fit. Okay, this is this is sloppy sloppy coding on my uh, on my um, side. Um, I will explain you later what this um, problem is. I'm gonna write this down again and gonna rewrite it. But also now in this part, I want to change my config file further. You remember the commands for number of iterations? I want to add them here. We have a bit more of maximum iterations and a bit more stringent relative error. So let's go to maybe 30 iterations. And here I can put 10 to the minus four because I want to let my code iterate a bit. Okay, finally, I will remove this again. I run this again. Oh, look at now chi square. It dropped to 100, 100, 100. Still not ideal, but much better than what it was. Here it only does two iterations for RQUV. Let's hope that it got something good. I open it, I plot it, and now Stokes I is perfect. Stokes Q and U are almost non existent. Hmm, what is this thing? How do we how do we cure that? Stokes V is working really really well though. Okay, try and change. Let's try and change this situation. Y B Z. Okay, that's fine. And here we had this. What I suggest we do is. We try to put it the way that it was before and give a little bit more weight to you and you. I'm going to try like this. All right. That's a better job. Okay, chi square for Stokes I working fine as previously. Okay, now Stokes Q and you are operations. Let's see what is happening here. Bam, bam. All right, now we finally have a fit. Took us some time to set it up. Let's make it a little bit more beautiful and then we can can discuss this. No, not line width. I want to say legend uh, label equals fit number and then plus string of uh, i plus one. Cool. 
legend and I increase this a little bit all right ah no no I also want this everywhere all right how's this for a fit not bad let's discuss a little bit what we have here so we have stoke psi which is fit fitted amazingly right and first of all i want you to all pay attention to how single slab approximation does a great job at fitting okay so if our noise here that we input was 10 uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 4 and chi square that e fitting found was around 100 what kind of noise would i have to put in so that my chi square for stokes i is around one by the way this is all reduced chi square so normalized with the number of valence can anybody tell me so right now my chi square is 100 and the chi square is calculated from the number that we prescribed for the no for the noise what do i have to do with that number in order to get chi square chi square to drop to one is it by a factor of 10 exactly so uh if i increase it by a factor of 10 it would have to be 5 times 10 to the minus 3 my chi square would be around 1 and that would mean that my model and my uh observations agree down to the factor of 5 times 10 to the minus 3 5 times 10 to the minus 3 is less than a percent okay so our model here and our observations agree to less than a percent on average and now you might want to say hi hey, ivan why are you telling to us that thing the kist will measure 10 to the minus 5 for polarization signals okay 10 to the minus 4 true it will but i'm not talking about that kind of agreement i'm talking about the fact that the, our assumption that this is a simple slab works so remarkably well okay that's the point that i'm that i'm making here okay then look at the stokes q Stokes Q is four times 10 to the minus three amplitude and it's fit wonderfully. Stokes U is much, much less. There we can, you know, kind of negotiate whether fit makes sense or not. I would argue that we can't really make much better fit than, 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 than what is already here. You can try to play with it and see. And Stokes V is also reasonable. Of course, it cannot reproduce this thing there because Stokes V has to be, you know, symmetric. To, a, to some degree maybe okay when you turn on passion back it won't be quite symmetric but it will never be so asymmetric like here but we still got a good fit all right did everybody get this good fit on their own computers after all this meddling not yet okay so let me remind you what you need to change you need to put height which is around 20 arc seconds you need to make the first cycle fit only stokes i and the other cycles um and in the other cycle fit all of them but give more weight to q u and also more more weight to v but not as much as to q and u and also make sure you you delete you 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 write them down nicely so that it works like this we had this small error which said stokes to fit equals stokes times something delete that something delete that times 0 0.88 something okay Then eventually it should it should work. I'm gonna slowly now inspect the physical parameters that came out of that, that came out of this. Okay. Oh. Uh, here we can get chi square if we want for our last cycle. Uh, here I don't need this. Well, actually i can do like this good equals one this is we can use this later to kind of distinguish between good and bad solutions if you want but here i only want actually sorry it should be zero here are the parameters that we are interested in okay By is very weak. Bz is 50 Gauss. 
sorry, BX is 50 Gauss, BZ is 20 Gauss. Optical depth is three. So whoever said that it's optically thick was correct. Line of sight is not huge. Most of you are not interested in line of sight, but uh, maybe you will be at some point. Thermal velocity is around six kilometer per second. Makes sense. Beta, we didn't fit for. And damping is high, 0 0.27. Okay. One of the reasons, okay, I, I made a big fuss about how, how things agree very well. But this magical parameter here, which is line damping, is kind of doing a lot of job to make your fits in Stokes I much, much better. Okay. I'm not convinced that this is really just line damping. This is also accounting for some weird line shapes and helping them look, look much better. Okay. But what would you say looking at this magnetic field? What kind of filament this is? Quiescent filament. It's basically a prominence just looked from above. Magnetic fields are very weak. They're over 10 Gauss, 10 ish Gauss. We're going to see later in the afternoon that this is what people typically find in the prominence. All right. Uh, so, yeah, look how, how weak magnetic field we managed to detect along the line of sight. 20 Gauss, okay? The amplitude two times 10 to the minus three in Stokes V. It's really, really, these were really, really good observations. Really small signal to noise. This was probably integrated over quite some, you know, part of the spectrum, but it's really nice. Okay, does this work for everybody now? Yes, no, some feedback? Yes, yeah, some people say no. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna change, I'm gonna load some other profile. I'm gonna try to fit it. You folks can, if this doesn't work for you, you can continue working on that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come and ask you questions and see if, it's, if it makes sense. And if this will work for you out of the box, then you can also change. For example, one interesting one that I saw was, uh, I think it was 11, let's see. There's no 11, maybe it was 10. Yeah, look at this beast. Quite some, this is quite some beast. Uh, this is obviously not fitable, right? With our current setup. So this is a setup where you would have to use multi-component model. So maybe you don't wanna do it right now because we only have 15 minutes. But if somebody's interested in, in uh, this is, by the way, probably a SPQ. Judging from the big, uh, very, very broad line, so it's probably a SPQ, which is, you know, there is a lot of material that this light is coming from. So it's integrated, it's integrating over big line of sight and we see velocities uh, of, of, that are maybe going toward and away from us. So we see multiple components here kind of contributing to this thing. Okay, but the interesting thing is that there is Stokes Q in SPQ. Right. We also see two components in Stokes Q. So maybe let's take something simpler. Let's try six. Okay, this is a nice prominence. You can try this one. Keep in mind, you just need to change your viewing angle and your boundary condition. So I'm going to slowly start working, working through this. I like to, here in this example, I like to name things differently. I know when to load them. So here I'm gonna change this to 90 degrees, zero, save this. Here I'm gonna change this to A6. For the starters, I'm just going to use the same one as I used previously. And here in comp A6. Name the output, output A6. And here going to change all these to A6. You don't have to do this. You can just use the regular generic name or whatever you like. I just do this so that later, if we need to pull something back, it's gonna be this works. It's doing something. 
it seems to be terrible for me. Oh, wow. Not good. I do what I did here. This, because I think this might uh, override what the uh, was not good. And and if this happens, then you have to look at what what the code outputs here. Using of normalization makes sense. Zero makes sense. Why doesn't it work? because of the height I would also maybe change this on these. Okay, now a little bit better. Doing some doesn't seem to be quite getting what I want to have. Ah, not good. But not good. Looks like I missed something. Did anybody pick this one and try to play with it? All right, so we have a competition. Very good. Looks good. We inverted these ones yesterday, so we should be able to, to invert it at some point. Oh, there it goes. When I reset it, the, the kernel, it, it did a good job. Interesting thing to try. Sometimes when this happens, it can be because of the model. Um, you can delete model and try again. That is what happened. Now, if it makes any sense. Okay, we got something here. They need more height because Stokes Q is super bad. And also, maybe I don't fit 
here for the prominence, I should be safe with not fitting uh, Stokes I at all in the, off -plane, in the second cycle. Let's put the height to this one. This one, um, this one is there if you don't provide the file for the wavelength. So in principle, this one is going to override this one here. You have to comment this one. Okay, that's weird. But do you have a new wavelength file here? Hmm, interesting. Okay, I'll try to see what that happens because for me it exists and then uh, okay, maybe we don't have the same version of the of hazel but that shouldn't be the I, I doubt that that is something that changed uh, let me try and redo this here what we're trying to get we're trying to fix this and I already know that if I miss linear polarization it's because it's most likely because of the height let's run this one again Oh, look, high square really dropping nice. So I think this is going to be great. Okay. Oh, that. Not quiet, honestly. Look at there. Why is that so? I square is very low. Fine. But you're not fitting really, really great. Try giving more weight. You and you. Sometimes you have to do this. Sometimes you have to cheat like this. By adding more weight to some. I think if this works, not quite. Let's see what kind of results we have. This is not. What I think is happening is that our BX is too large. So it's killing off our polarization, right? Let's try not fitting Stokes V at all to see if, if the code will do something. What I can try is I can try not to fit Stokes V at all in the second cycle. Stokes I is always going to be great. That's not a problem. Stokes V, Stokes V and U though. Okay. Open it. Okay, I think this is a problem with Yeah, weird. Any problem with my notebook? I just don't like that this is happening. You can try to increase height more. Try and do that. 
height here to 50. Where that was. Not in love with that solution. But, and um, yeah. Turn stokes V way. Or, you know, what we can do is we can try to only stick fit stokes V and BX in, in the second cycle to constrain that. And then in the third cycle, we can do all three. Taking into account all three here. I changed a couple of things. Works. This is our last attempt before we go to lunch. Remove the output. I rerun the inversion here. What comes out? Stokes I is great. So that's at least, you know, something. Now let's see what happens here. Stokes V seems to be very easy. Okay, this is some kind of fit, reasonable. Okay, good. Load it. And try it out. Okay, now it's now it's better. Stokes V is kinda terrible though. Okay. Kind of really, really bad. This is one thing that you will encounter sometimes is that it's hard to reconcile all these all these parameters. So now next thing that I can do is I can try, okay, well, height seems seem to have helped because at least my Stokes U is good. Let's now try to maybe increase height even more. But another thing that I could do is in order to not get this spoil here, I could say, well, let me not change BX because that's my line of sight component during the during the last uh, uh, during the last one and i can also not consider stokes v at all during the last cycle okay i lied this is the last attempt and let's increase height even more but now we are going to a little bit uh, less uh, realistic heights i think this is not really quite a prominence anymore this is maybe be something in the corona. quite high in the corona but okay Okay, good. It got some fits. Boom, boom. Okay, this was uh, not very clever. Uh, let's keep it at this. And what I'm going to do while we, uh, I'm going to put the things back the way they were. So I'm going to fit uh, for uh, for all three components here. And uh, here I'm going to also change BX. And what I'm going to do instead of repeating this and smashing my head against the wall, I'm going to get let the code do multiple randomizations. So when we get back from lunch, we can examine these multiple randomizations. Hmm. Yeah, that's definitely that's definitely an option. You mean if the slab is a little bit away or a little bit ahead? True. True, true. Another thing is that maybe we don't have the correct uh, angle of the orientation of our, our polarimetry um, um, for, for determining Q and U, so the code simply cannot get uh, get there. I can look up. I can see if I have it somewhere for this uh, for this specific example. But for the moment, let me rerun it, and uh, we can go and and since these are tip observations, there is another thing which could be, which is that maybe Stokes Q is defined with uh, rotated with respect to ninety degrees. So I'll uh, I'll let this run. See if we get any any good. Uh, maybe for five randomizations, we can see if we have any good fits. And uh, yeah, we can all go for lunch. So you can leave this running if you want, same way as me. I'm just gonna have a quick look at something, and then we can, because I have solutions for these in a separate folder. Uh, we will continue at one twenty-five. I will also put this 
We'll do Q&A then. Okay, okay. And in articles and links, I'm giving you a legend to these. Um, legend. Examine it and see. Here you will find it, all the solutions done with with old uh, with old uh, uh, Hazel. You can kind of figure it out. Give the You have some hints what you should do. There you have solution that you should get. So yeah. Okay, we'll uh, we'll leave this running here. And uh, we can go for lunch, don't worry. Um, and in uh, the polls, you don't have a lot of that. You might have some faculty, some patches where you have a little bit of continuity, but, but for the most part, it's really quiet, sort of mixed polarity stuff. And using these these disambiguation methods that are based on you know expectation of continuity is probably really hard, and for the most part, it delivers not physical results. But again, I'm not the expert. You want to say something? Well, yeah, I, I think the, the question maybe even then, do you, since it's very patchy, do you even care whether you resolve the ambiguity? Do you care? So it, it's it's slightly different that at the poles, of course, your uh, your horizontal field is not ambiguous, right? Because it's line of sight. Well, your vertical field is. Uh, and so do you really care what sign it is? Oh, so you just just care about the, st the field strength. I mean, you have horizontal in two directions. So in one direction, you still true, have true. transverse field that corresponds true. to. True. Yeah. True. So it, it is. And the solutions at the pole, the two solutions are very different in terms of inclination and azimuth. Oh, not always, but it's not just your azimuth <laughs> in the transverse plane yeah. with respect to the solar sort of surface. That is true. So the ambiguity would result in a very different flux? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that he's working on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if there's just a general consensus on the okay method to use for now. Maybe even has an opinion, but what I've seen is the, the Japanese papers, the series of papers from the Hinode, the first observations of polar fields from Hinode, and their disambiguation method is pretty Spartan, right? It's like, oh, we have these two solutions, and we choose the one that is either closest to horizontal or closest to vertical. And that's probably loosely based on we expect the fields to be mostly radial. But I don't think it has any other physical thing that grounds it to reality, but maybe I'm being too harsh. I, I, I'm just I wondering, know. say I try to push to this paper. Wrong. And just <laughs> want to be uh, sure that everyone can be happy. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you, sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't think that anybody has a real answer. Yeah. So in a sense, you cannot go wrong right? <laughs> because uh, you will present something that is being thought through. 
and yeah. uh, will make some physical sense. Yeah. And uh, I think that for now, this is the best we can do. Yeah. I mean, until uh, solar orbiter goes a little bit higher over the ecliptic, and you can see these things a little better, and you can at that point maybe comparing what you derived from Earth versus what Phi really sees. That is, uh, that's the best we can do. Yeah, the stereoscopic measurements that yeah. Graham was pointing out today. Yeah. Um, it's not just that it goes oh, higher, no, 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 it goes higher so, so, yeah. so that you see it less for short. Yes, right. that's one. And yeah. then the other thing is it's a different vantage point too. Sure, this is true. I guess that could these things be checked on, say, coronal holes? You know, in a sense, the, the flux distribution in corona holes might be similar to what you have on the holes, maybe. So that if you have um, views of different angles of these kind of flux distributions, you might gain some insight. About the flux. I mean, I was talking about comparison at the individual pixel level and trying to use the two vantage points to constrain the magnetic field direction. Yes, like but this for a solution. few years, this will be still on the ecliptic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So there will be no net gain in terms of polar, mm -hmm. polar fields, unless you want to use that as an analogy of what you, distribution of fluxes you consider is similar, but probably not. Mm -hmm. mm. It's all open questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I just comment. You know, a lot of times with inversions and these disambiguation and these various methods, you ask, is this the right way to do it, right? Is this the correct way to do it? And that, that you, you know, there is no correct way, right? There is no way that you can say this is the right way and everything else is not. So sometimes you just have to choose a method, an approach, justify why, examine whether that's introducing biases and just say using this method this is what i found right make sure that's clear but you know you, you know in the research you don't you're not having this is the right you know number of nodes to use this is the right you know inversion setup and everything you just have to someone's just going with it and that feels funny sometimes because that's not what we all sometimes think of science as but you know that's just how it is sometimes that, that's a really good point. And I, I was going to add that I think it was you that pointed out the other day. I mean, one way to, to go about understanding the limitations of your methods is using simulations as a ground truth and then contrasting your method with the ground truth and trying to understand the biases that they incur. Um, but other than that, yeah. It is. It's not your side, Eric. <laughs> Yeah. I would argue that you need to do that before you do the research, but that's a different story. <laughs> it's philosophy, not anything else. Thanks for that question, Ryan. It's heated debate. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is kind of any sense, but I was wondering if changing the weight of the, this is more a question for Kevin. Just using another modulation scheme could be given more idea about the, the information of the angles. I mean, using more process of the module during the modulation, you mentioned that you have kind of not four, probably you have like probably getting more than that, more combinations. Could be, I mean, have been tested or this is any sense of it? Yeah, you could pick a modulation scheme, say that maybe weighted the Q and the U more if you were, uh, you know, more interested in those, you know, the horizontal fields or the transverse fields, um, or if you take more, more data, right? I mean, you know, at some point you're always getting out the same four parameters, but if you take more data, then you get better signal to noise on those. Right. Oh, the ambiguity? To, uh, to use different modulation schemes, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, well, you know, like the simulation and doing tests like that, you could, you know, test modulation, different modulation schemes or modulation rates and so on and see if those are affecting your results. 
you know, if those change your results, if you change these observational parameters uh, as well, you know, that would also be another good test that, you know, would be good to do, but of course these are, you know, <laughs> other uh, effort there and so on, but yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, were you talking again about the ambiguity? Well, I mean, that is in a sense, it's physical, right? Yeah, there yeah. is no way that those, that the Zeman effect has that problem, period. Yeah. There is no way around it. You can't tell the, you can the, tell the difference the between this and this yes. if you use the Zeman effect. No, <laughs> it's a real mathematical degeneracy. It's, yeah. So. And the Hanley effect is worse. Yeah, because it's got four. four. Yeah. <laughs> Purely, it's not about signal to noise anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to something I said the other day, and I firmly believe it misfortune is conserved so you gain in one direction <laughs> you might get a better signal to nose and so skew but then you lose something else somewhere along the line so you have to choose depending on the problem that you want to solve i think yeah no of course <laughs> but he has a thought <laughs> I always say the holy grail of all these efforts right is to be able to measure the changes in the magnetic field during a flare right you know that would be where you would really get this connection in space weather if you could measure the chromospheric field and the chronal field and how they change the you know, and the reconnection process occurs during a flare, you know, that would be great. But I think we're still <laughs> far, away from it. far away from that signal to noise, understand, you know, the line profiles is during a flare and so on. It's all, uh, you know, all the radiative transfer effects. But, you know, that would get you to this deep understanding of the energy release in a flare and how it expands out into the, I might have a comment. I mean, the people that do this heliospheric field are very conscious of the limitation of the measurement. So one, one thing that we never discussed because it's not what we're doing, but they use the whole sun, you know, the, the ball, the sphere. And so the field that they think is on the other side of the sun is something that they measured two weeks ago or something, right? That they use the full Carrington um, rotation for creating these maps. They keep updating them, but at the end of the day, you use something that you measured today and something that you measured two weeks ago, right? So there is a lot of biases already there. So I'm not sure that a few hundred gauss of difference at the <laughs> photospheric level will bother them so, so much uh, on the one hand. What I think they really would like to have is uh, some sort of measure of the, both the photospheric and the chromospheric and as high as you can feel because they're, they also use extrapolations, right? And you don't know exactly how good is that extrapolation today versus 
tomorrow and, and so on. Plus uh, having more real time data from the other side of the sun. And this is something that they're starting to do with um, both with some Helios seismology and some with the solar orbiter observations when solar orbiter is there instead of here, right? And again, these are very sparse. All of these are very sparse. And your seismology can tell you something about what's on the other side of the sun only when you have very big regions. And the solar orbiter is on the other side of the sun occasionally, <laughs> right? So I don't think that we should be too, too worried about what you were talking about about. Also, they use global maps that have a very low spatial resolution because they are interested in the in the global field uh, rather than the details of this little pixel versus that little pixel. Yeah. So I guess that's my uh, my opinion. But there is I, a I fundamental... think that, that still doesn't mean that you uh, shouldn't strive to no, improve no, no, those that's measurements. Not, no, right? that's not what I'm saying. Yes. No, no, no. no, no. Yeah. But um, there is a fundamental question that isn't resolved in that you measure the total flux you know field on the sun and then you met you know remotely and you measure it in c2 and they're off by a factor of two yeah. right there's more flux detected in the heliosphere than the you know these simple uh inversions in the photospheric field would predict or you know measure so and why there's a factor this you know approximate factor of two difference is a is an open question yeah on the other hand and someone said the field changes by a factor of two it doesn't change our understanding of the sun too much right i mean it, it's not a big it's not the understanding of the sun i would say i would argue that the holy grail is being able to forecast the impacts of space weather on earth right so for that you really need to understand the heliosphere here field because that's what's channeling your space weather uh, all the way to us and I'm, I don't know how much a factor of two or three matters, but it seems to be a big deal for the heliospheric community. And this goes back to the polar field challenge, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. uh, these other fields that kind of eventually make it to a one or whatever it is. And these are the fields that we measure most poorly at the photosphere. Yeah. If you take those measurements to the chromosphere, maybe where the field is maybe less um, salt and pepper and more uniform and maybe more potential. <laughs> I don't know. The other thing you'll hear with respect to space weather is figuring out what BZ is in a filament, right? And which way field is aligned, because that changes how it interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, whether it's aligned or anti-aligned with the Earth's magnetic field changes completely the effects on Earth. And that can really only be measured, you know, this is the filament magnetic field, and that can only be measured in the chromosphere, really, itself. And so that's why this, you know, stuff with Hazel and 10830 seems to be that. But people at NOAA would love if, you know, we could tell them BZ all the time. Maybe completely naive, but uh, kind of related to what Jen was talking about um, in terms of the rotation of the whole sphere, right? Is has anyone looked at correlations between what we see at the center of the disk and what we see at the chromosphere when it's rotated 90 degrees. You know, if you were trying to predict it forward in time and say, when what I observe at the photosphere at center of sun has rotated to the limb, then can I make a prediction and then compare to what I observe at the limb, which then you, I don't know how that like, they may be completely uncorrelated by the time it rotates there. I don't know. Probably less so for active regions and more so for... Yeah, well, I mean, I think that has been done some for some active regions that were particularly interesting and so on. But, you know, you also have a week. So that is a lot of evolution lot in, of the, yeah. in the field yeah. itself. So... And prominence. Uh, I, um, I don't know. Even had a beautiful picture of a prominence that was observed on disk and as it traveled towards the limb. Yeah. And a completely different view. But again, yeah, she's right. There's a ton of evolution. So I don't know what kind of correlation you expect a um, big picture yes at <laughs> uh, the small detail maybe not but i have seen some of this trying to predict what's happening on the far side of the sun based on what we observed just yeah so there yeah i thought and i this is also not my feel i thought some of the far side was helioseismology based right yes uh, so you you look at oscillations on this side of the sun, but not necessarily at, at sunspots themselves, but how the sun, yeah, 
is oscillating all over. Right. Essentially, you sense the presence of a strong magnetic field uh, from the way that the oscillations change, you yeah. know, with respect to normal or quiet or whatever. That is how the technique works. Yeah. Okay. Prominence. Something called the March of something. The March of. I had it. I took a screenshot of it because I thought it was so amazing. I mean, this one no. kind of shows. Yeah, that's true. No, Ryan had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. sorry. The... This room... Well, he looks right here. Uh, yeah, this might be this might be a silly question, sort of unrelated. Uh, but to what extent is the stuff that we've learned this week, so inversion of Stokes profiles, uh, used outside of solar physics? So can you do this stuff with stellar profiles or other even missions observing polarization of stellar profiles? Planetary science as well. If you we had a conversation at lunch the other day, if you pointed VISP at Jupiter, for example, uh, could you learn anything interesting there? Is the broad knowledge that <laughs> no, I, I mean, certainly uh, people do spectral polarimetry, even disk integrated spectral polarimetry using the rotation to dis to disambiguate disambiguate uh, uh, the location of of strong magnetic fields on, on solid on sun you know star disks, right? Uh, so so it uh, there are, of course because the lack of resolution, there's other techniques that you have to um, rely on. Uh, but but people do spectral polarimetry of, of this planetary science. I don't know. Uh, I, I guess scattering polarization, scattering polarization might be yeah. might be uh, might be useful there. Uh, but I, probably the magnetic fields would be so weak that you would not see them in uh, same on splitting. Yeah. yeah, but scattering doesn't only talk of yeah. It's not just for magnetic fields. It talks about geometry. Geometry, yeah, yeah. right? So yeah. you you can learn about. Well, now I'm talking about something I don't know anything about, so I'm going to maybe stay quiet. <laughs> um, but yes, it is used in, in other fields. And there's, there's a bunch of instruments that look at polarization in, in stars. Yeah. I don't know. I like missions. space missions. I don't know. There's a whole field called Zeman Doppler imaging um, that That's uses stars. the Zeman effect in yeah. stars to find star spots and yeah, the modified techniques, but the physics is. Hello. Sure. Actually, yeah. This is a, yeah. That's a uh, brand new mission, right? It's launching in December. Yeah, yeah actually. Uh, yeah, but will you hear me anyway? Uh, interesting thing which we always, which we tend to forget and neglect is that there is a lot of polarization in uh, uh, active galaxies and quasars and uh, call them. So actually, the the thing that brought resolution to Enigma, what are type one and type two, uh, like galactic nuclei or whatever, came through polarization, because they figured that by that's actually scattered light coming from the from the you know this halo that there is around the accretion disk and so on, and that scattered light emits uh, linear polarization, and by measuring that linear polarization, they figured out that that's what's uh, you know. Um, along that direction. Something has to break the symmetry. Something has to break the symmetry. Yeah, yeah. That was in '90s, I think, when these papers came out. And uh, but one thing to keep in mind is that these people, they all speak different language than us. Uh, so yeah, yeah. that when you go there, you need to bring a glossary to kind of you know compare methods, notations, and so on. Uh, so that's uh, that's one thing just to keep in mind. But of course, that doesn't mean that we should not uh, mingle. And yeah, uh, in like before COVID, maybe in uh, 2000, when was it, 14, there was a big conference on spectropolarimetry in Costa Rica where they brought people from all the fields. Yeah. Yeah, and also it. before that, there was one in uh, Grenoble in uh, in France where there was also people from various fields and the results there were really interesting. Like we were looking at protoplanetary disks, stars, galaxies. Of course, there was, uh, you know, biceps experiment uh, and, and so on for the microwave background. So that's all super, super cool. problem with the uh, Zeeman splitting and no resolution is that it, you know, you tend to have both polarities, you have, you know, in an unresolved object and they cancel out. So 
But you need fast rotating. You need a fast, like, yeah, you know, something that rotates on that to the disc or it breaks. This the side of the disc is blue shifted. This side of the disc is red shifted, and you're right. Then you, they can cancel out. Yeah. By scattering, I think is more why. Or you analyze a thousand or millions of lines at the same time, right? You uh, consider them as one line and. So this is the prominence one. Maybe, maybe that maybe that that's no. not the one, but that's. Yeah, yeah. It's I think you're having a Okay. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for the questions. I'm making yeah. it lively. That's yeah. Well, then okay. If there are no more questions, then I would like to uh, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, ask you to join me in recognizing all the. Uh, hard work and dedication that uh, Rebecca has put into this workshop. Since we started talking about this uh, workshop, uh, you've, been, you've been very concerned about our well-being during this meeting, and it, I think it really shows that it went flawless and... Uh... Flushing. I mean, this is not the end of the meeting, even <laughs> but this is, was not just me, by the way. The, these no, no, I mean, you here. said the committee has done this and then Rebecca did all this work, <laughs> so. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry to, sorry to bring you back to the, to the to reality. <laughs> to, to the, versions anyway uh i pushed uh, the updated version of the notebook so if you couldn't follow what i exactly did you can download it now uh and i got some uh, positive results so we can have a look at them real quick and uh, and i can show you that we actually see in the real data also the ambiguities that we saw yesterday so um let me show you what has been running during the during the break uh one thing that i did just on a hunch we can try and see if that actually works. Is uh, I went and changed the. We're on, so I'll just them off in case we weird. So yeah, one thing that I did was I changed the, the orientation angle angle for Stokes Q um, up here in preparing these files. I set this to ninety. It was just a hunch. I don't know if it's that way, but I just know that very often. Uh, you know, the Spanish people assume uh, opposite orientation than we do. Uh, and and there is a very practical reason for that is that when you plot your Stokes Q in the absence of the magnetic field, it looks positive. It doesn't flip on the on the negative side, right? And uh, and then I did like five randomizations and this is what you get. These are the fits that you get. So actually the first one that we tried was a little bit ugly, but all the other ones are quite nice and they actually fit our Stokes Q very satisfactory. Typically, what I would do in this case is I would print out the chi squares and I would, according to them, try to identify which one is bad. Okay, in this case, they're not that different. So I can't really say that, but I know that the first one is the orange one, which I don't like. So I'm going to remove it by making this little array here called good. Okay, and the good all skips the first one, which means the index zero, and then contains one, two, three, four, first, second, third, and fourth inversion. All right, then I'm going to print out the results. And when you print out the results, um, it shouldn't be a surprise for you anymore that these values are very, very different. Okay. I trust a little bit more the ones which have this magnetic field, uh, which is a little bit high, right? This first one has very weak magnetic field, like 0 0.11. That should be that's the green one, right? I would also skip over that one, maybe. So let's actually do it that way, maybe this. And in this one, you're going to see something that we already saw multiple times. Uh, your line of sight magnetic field is well constrained. Okay. And your line of sight uh, magnetic field is well constrained because it's determined by Stokes V. Stokes V is created by Zeman effect, and there is no ambiguity there at all, right? We are in very simple geometry. So one of the components of our magnetic field is very well, very well constrained, which is very, very nice. But the other two exhibit the ambiguity. And in this case, in this specific case that we got here, they exhibit 90, uh, sorry, 180 degree ambiguity. So here I have 3.5 magnetic field and 0 
Here I have minus 3.5 and minus 0 0.88. So I can plot them now using this, uh, you know, little, little, you know, thinking that we made here. And you will see that actually x, this is the x axis here. This is y, this is z. And you will see that they're pointing toward us, but in the plane of the sky, they are at 90 degrees. So now we can see if we can um, actually plot it in the two-dimensional way. If you scroll down, there are much more examples in ways. Uh, here is a little piece of code that I can use to, uh, to plot it in the, in the two-dimensional coordinate system. Let me see. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. There are the 2D vectors. Um, let me see if this will just work out to the box. Hopefully so. Yeah, here they are. I just need to change the. Uh, this is the thing, right? This is our plane of the sky now. This is BY, BZ. This is 180 degree and be good. In this specific case, there was not really, uh, you know, there were not really multiple solutions or we didn't find them. So we could rerun this and go ahead and try to find most, more solutions and plot them. All right. And, and I definitely suggest you do that on your own if you want to go through these. I want to show you yet another thing, yet another, you know, regime of physics and maybe introduce you to how to do with, uh, with multiple pixels now and we don't have that much time. So if, let's say, if we started at, uh, no, we'll make, uh, oh, is there a rubber here? Yeah. Um, we started at 1.30, so I'll try to finish at one uh, at 2.30. And then we can have a, huh? Now it's two o'clock. Yeah, 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 but I mean, so Rebecca, what do you say? How do we do this now? Yeah, 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 gotcha. Um, No, no, me neither. Me neither. Uh, you know what? Let's just uh, let's just get going. Let's just have a look at a completely different set of data, and actually, it's going to be a map. Uh, and then uh, I'm gonna, yeah. Let's just have a look at this map. We can try to invert some specific pixels from there. We could kind of see which kind of strands we have. We can just examine the data a little bit. This is something that you are more familiar with. It doesn't require you to use Hazel immediately. So we can kind of see what what kind of things exist there, and uh, if you like it, you can you know come back to this, or you can come back to that, or I can tell you where to download more data of that type, and so on and so on. Okay, so just to wrap up with this thing here, this is kind of process that that you would generally go when you're inverting. One technicality is that it seems that for some of you, this line here overrides what this line here is doing. It could be that that's because I installed this Hazel a while back and I'm just using it and you installed it last week. So you have a slightly newer version and maybe the outer changed this. You, you just do that by deleting this thing here. Basically from here, you can, you can delete everything that is redundant. I think this is redundant and the line of sight should also be redundant. So yeah, you can, you can in principle delete these, these things there. As well as boundary condition should be redundant not needed yeah good let's open a new jupyter notebook yes go ahead we'll walk you through again to this sure yeah 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 uh so this configuration well let's let's try and see if everything works as it should when i when i delete this stuff here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to delete um so I our output I hear you in Zoom. I'm gonna change so this back to one random station. The webcast. And I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna delete all the stuff that we shouldn't need. So we shouldn't delete the, need this, we shouldn't need this, we shouldn't need this, right? The latency is surprisingly good. I think you shouldn't need this either. See if this works. Just crossed. Yeah, it does. Okay, so let's see, are you config. 
Let me read that computer. So I'm I'm just experimenting. If I had spotlit, oh, this is a different scene. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. So right right now, nice. this is projector full screen. But all right. Uh, so yeah, sure. I can. I, I'm happy to work with this shot. Again. So basically, the name of your output file where it will put things. Keep in mind that this output file, in the case you invert multiple pixels, like what we're gonna learn now can be much, much larger. And you, it will be, a, it can be 100 pixels, 1000 pixels, whatever, right? So it's gonna be in HDF5 file. Okay. Here you are already pre-telling the code, how many cycles you want. Cycles means which Stokes profile I'm fitting uh, with which parameters I'm fitting them. And you can change things there do as you, as you please. This is the maximum number of iterations that I sometimes like to, to increase because sometimes code starts from a very bad solution and it needs some time to ramp up to, to fit. This is the relative error. Relative error means when chi-square changes by less than this, stop, right? Because we don't want to decrease chi-square from 1 to 0 0.99999 to 0 0.9998 to 0 0.9997. We want to say, okay, stop here, right? Uh, so all the things with the hashtag in between, hashtag with whatever design is, they are they are just comments, right? This is where you define your spectral region, right? This is how your uh, this this first line here basically tells you how is my how is this piece of spectrum going to be called in the output? It's not really important. This thing here tells you what you're fitting for 99% of the cases. Until you move to much more complicated cases, it's, this is going to just say chromosphere. Right. In principle, you could do multiple chromospheres like this, or you could do photosphere in the chromosphere, but we're not going to do that right now. Where you specify the valent file that you created, and here we created it by hand in a way. We created it from our notebook. In your real life, you probably don't want to use notebooks. You want to have Python code, like, like the ones that I'm going to show you in a bit. So this is a wavelength file that you will maybe get from the people who did observations to you, or you created the wavelength file yourself, for example, by finding location of one spectral line, the other spectral line, and then interpolating in between and getting your own wavelength grid. So these are the um, weights are for each wavelength and each stoke separately. Right so these are like arrays, right? And these are, you are typically gonna keep them equal to one, unless you really wanna, in a very sophisticated way, give more importance to some wavelengths than the other wavelengths. Uh, here in, in 1030, that doesn't happen very often, but maybe in D3, you will have a telluric line and you will want to skip to ignore these wavelengths that correspond to the telluric line. This is a good way to do it. You set this weight to yeah. zero there. So I... And finally, this is your observation file, which is this case is just a TXT file. We will see later that here we can put an HDF5 file that contains a cube of observations with a lot of yep. observations so and then go to use MPI sharing you know, and invert these things in parallel. And, zoom. and I will show you how to do that. Uh, Here we now tune weights for Stokes IQ and U, but for different cycles. So this previously said, okay, in general, um, for all the cycles, um, these are the weights for different so uh, Stokes profiles for different valence. But here I'm actually choosing which spotlight. ones to fit so in which cycle. Me and, and writing things this way. Let's say in this example. Yep. And that is exactly it. what I think they are looking for. Um, I see you have like a couple of the window dressings, it looks like. Uh, but that is. Is. Um, that's fine. I'm going to have that too. The show problem. So what I have here is that I'm fitting. So, so I get three it's... cycles here. Here I have in the okay, first cycle fitting all the sides, the second cycle all the V, the exactly third cycle like all three, all three polarized profiles. Keep in mind that your chi square point. will only be calculated from these ones here. So if I, for example, did this, my chi square will only tell me. My, at least my final chi square will only tell me how well my Q and U are getting fit. Right. I can also give some more if I do this, then I'm fitting all three of them, but Q and U are counting more. You see what I'm typing? The, the, this part called spectral region kind of dealt with your observations. Now, the part called atmosphere deals with your model. And it's also very simple. Like you specify what your atmosphere is in this case it's a chromosphere 
you say for yeah. which spectral region yeah. it's, resp it's, it's responsible, it's responsible right. for this spectral region here. Uh, and uh, nice. the only thing that you need to specify is the height. And here you just to be consistent, you say, okay, take into account this spectral line, right? Any 30. Mm -hmm. And then reference atmospheric model is just there to specify initial values. You, we, we have seen yesterday how the reference atmospheric model looks like. It looks like this. Literally just nine numbers. Yeah, but you need to have it there so that your code knows where okay. to start from. Are you are you talking to me in Teams or in Zoom? I'll right double now. Should. And then you have the ranges. Ranges says how far are your parameters allowed to vary? How much your, are your parameters allowed to vary? And the okay. nodes, which in I'm, this I'm case are not nodes, Google, they're just what parameters are on and off for which cycle. Fine. That's it. Yeah. Right. So, so now if you paid attention, you now understand yeah. why in the second right. cycle I'm only fitting BX. And in the second uh, cycle, I'm only here downstairs. So in this specific okay. geometry, Perfect. which is on the limb, BX is directly responsible for V. Okay. okay. Keep in mind that the meaning of BX, BY, BZ are defined in the local system on the sun, not according to you. So typically when I ask you what's the line of sight component of magnetic field, you will say BZ because oh, that's what it is on the disk center. But here it's not, here it's BX because of our geometry. If I put, for example, uh, you know, if I, if I said that my observations have for some reason azimuth of 90 degrees, then BY would be my line of sight component. So on and so on, or minus, minus BY. You can, I will save this, I will commit it later so you have a reference. You can always come back here. There are, there are multiple instances of these. If you go back to, for example, Dickey's workshop number five, which was on helium, helium 1030, you can find more, so on and so on. So just now I wanna show you that how the real data will look like because this is an exercise data. It's real telescope data, but we are past this. People were doing this 20 years ago. Now we oh, hope I'm to get the, look at the, at the images. And oh, sadly there. the image that we have here is not, uh, Filament is not prominence, it's a sunspot. So all the polarized profiles that we're gonna see here are Zeman effect profiles. So for that, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna close down all yeah. the... So I'm gonna open a uh, different... And the name of this notebook is... This inversions. That is totally acceptable. Um, let me i again forgot to turn on the i oh, know I, I did not that's fine but i also want to have um okay. i have to, yeah then turn on the environment we all use this environment often as you yeah but i i mean i've had events where it was further off than this and everyone decided that it was good. So, so I'm gonna import um, all the things. I, I think that's, it's, that's it's totally files, acceptable, you but if you can continue I counting, I'm going to here. unmute on my Data. Whova stream and see uh, how SD. that sounds and looks. And then probably some, all of you worked with FITS files at some point, this is a FITS file downloaded from uh, publicly available database of uh, Gregor Solar Telescope, which has, uh, I think, two instruments that are relevant to us. One is called GRIS. GRIS is an infrared spectropolarimeter. Uh, it observes typically 1030 and 15, uh, and sorry, 1.5 micron lines of iron. The other instrument is the filter graph called, uh, called does anybody remember? The filter graph instrument of uh, Gregor that's is called. Really, that's really, no, this really is totally perfect. Oh, I mean, better than I would have expected. So, this is the this is going to be spectro spectrograph data with polarimeter. And when we open this FITS file here, what we're going to see is what it contains of, and it contains okay. three different distinct uh, data cubes or data products. One is a cube which has dimensions something for something something. So very often people give you data, you don't know what these somethings are. Uh, you figure it out by plotting various projections, but you can always say that four mm -hmm. is gonna be four Stokes parameters. Here I know that one uh, 1010 is number of wavelengths, so there is a lot of wavelength points here. These are the spatial coordinates. 
next one which actually gives us the value of the valence and then the next one which gives us a continuum image. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna export my, my contents of my Stokes profiles into one a variable called cube and the context of my valence into another variable there, but... called LL for valence. Uh, yep. And... So we're, we're doing uh, spotlights so that it goes for everyone in the meeting. It's just pinning for everyone. Changing that, we already called it data. So I can just say data zero data. And now you see my cube is 436 times 250 times 4 times 110. And this is so what I always do first is I plot image. What is image? It's X and Y distribution for first Stokesville component for first wavelength. Right. Make this image a little bit larger. The image here, right? This is the sunspot. The resolution is not super hot. The, hot, the contrast is not super hot. The reason for both of these things is we are in the infrared. So resolution is typically two times lower. The contrast is also a little bit lower. The contrast also looks a little bit low here because oh, we look at the sound spot. The difference between the intensity okay, of the center and the right side intensity maybe, is quite a bit. So what I was going to do- is One thing that I would generally do is I would also expand. normalize it somehow, but we're gonna leave that for later, okay? And put all those that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna calculate the mean spectrum. And all the Why am I looking at the mean spectrum? Well, I want to see what spectral lines I'm capturing and where yeah, they are. I, I tested that. And that I calculate the well. mean spectrum as np no dot me over the first and the second axis, right. which are the spatial right. axis, and I plot that. Everywhere. And when I plot that, I see that there's a quite a bit of spectral lines. Helium 1030 is this miserable line here. Okay. Okay. It's very weak compared to, for example, this line here. This line here is the infamous mm -hmm. silicon van line. Quite strong. It's non LTE. It brings some additional information here. As we will see, it also exhibits Stokes signals. Here we will not see any linear polarization signals. Okay. This is just me playing with the fit data. I still didn't go to Hazel yet. Okay. Uh, so now we might want to know between which indexes our helium line is because we want to select that region specifically. A little script that I have that I will share with you later is doing all these things automatically, right? So if I look, I see that I'm interested in between points like 250 maybe yes. and 300. Um, yeah, it does. So, and I have um, to have me, I found I more precisely ready. 230 or and 370. Mm -hmm. I just, yes, I did share it. I will plot um, it. You will actually see that helium is very, uh, very uh, fine here, right? I'm not so even going to zero. This during Q and A. Zero. That's something that they've been talking. So what's the top? Top this is, is eighty thousand. This is the full screen feed. Guilty. Y range. Um, and you know, people in the audience can ask questions. On actually, here. what I can do is I can do mean uh, spectrum divided by MP max. Oh, you know, so like that is one I option. Say that here I can say so Y range from zero to one to point. Have the questions on screen. Oh. No, it's Y limb. Y range is in IDL, right? And then I think the other would be Stockholm syndrome. All of us. There you go. Also. Right, very weak line. So even though here we will see that we have a lot of helium ten thirty, it's a it's a very weak line. Right. No, and I, so we I see that the minimum is around index three ten. Oh, that's very neat because now I can plot. It's kind of normalized, uh, and I'm going to normalize it to some local continuum. Yeah. Let's say that my local continuum is around index 240. So I'm going to plot my line depth in helium, which is going to be around 310 divided by 240. Well, I think and this I'm plot was, the map this of is depth. basically so I'm doing right. that so in my next. This was a panel. Um, the camera shot would be fairly, you know, fairly innocent. Seated so I do that. Plus and now we see the map, which looks plus, significantly you know, different. Our, right? virtual panelists in the video. Now, if I just show you this and ask you, so this, there would be what is this? Maybe you wouldn't immediately know blocks. it. Right. Previously, you. And now you could say, well, this tells me where I have helium 1030, where I don't. It's not quite like that because you, for example, see these uh, yeah. patterns in the center of the sunspot. Mm -hmm. These are there yeah, because yeah. their velocity is going, left, is going up and down. So your line is going left so. and right. So your line center is moving. 
left and right. So what I suggest we do now, I don't know if I have it coded, we can integrate all of, of wavelengths and actually find something like a total of top senators that shouldn't be so sensitive to develop. A monitor, there's a lot of stuff. But let's try and see. And get a demo of Slido and see why, uh, how that would look like. Um, okay. Oh, actually, yeah. I have. So it. let's say there were two virtual so, panels. So what I'm doing is I'm defining something called depth. That we were switching depth back and forth is between the, the, the wavelength. Just in these ranges between 240 and 370 divided by um, 240. We could also, and then I'm summing the depth over the wavelength axis and then I'm plotting that. So I would do that. Looks similar. Yeah. We can see, uh, we can see a okay, replace um, spotlight. Do something like view. this divide. I can, I can switch the zoom view if I need to. But yeah, basically, the number of some switching with zoom. Then I can put the color bar here probably, and play with it a little bit. We do that sometimes during our panel presentations where we so let's make say, the attendee view switch between speaker view and gallery view. So right now I just force gallery view using spotlight. So when I'm there in person and my Zoom laptop is next to me. So we will see that this will probably be, I can make it more. Uh, so we can play with this later and we will see that, I mean, maybe we will not see it today, but if you invert this whole map at home or at your, your, you know, your supercomputer or whatever you have at home, you will maybe see that this map correlates quite well with the map of optical depth in helium-1030. Basically, optical depth tells you how much of your ion is, is absorbed. Right. So now we can do some, um, some spectra and yeah, contrary to previous notebook, this one works quite yeah. well. So what I'm generally going to do is I'm going to yep. divide my yeah, cube. I will log them into my Zoom I mean, my mean spectrum. And then I'm going to plot them. some some spectral um, profiles. I want to see how my polarization. Start them like during lunch or before the normalized the day. View. So I'll start those meetings an hour. And here I'm choosing specific indexes of pixels. In room. So here is 60, 70. What is 60? And we'll pass co-host out to everyone. Okay, yeah. Keep in mind that I'm plotting every image. Able to share so over top of each other. For that, it's so that my X and Y on the image um, correspond no to my X and Y like in my, my matrices. Out. Because Python plots things like, like matrices. It doesn't plot them like images. Okay. So what we have here is we have 60, 70. What is 60, 70? 60 is somewhere around here. 70 is around here. It's one of these black, you know, dark patches. Maybe we want to go like here, like, 250, 120, or something like that. Let's try that. What do we say? 250, 120. 250, yeah. 120. Okay, Plot that. And we will see that there is some intensity. Okay, absorption line. Nice. Stokes Q and U, not very optimistic no, about that. But Stokes V, there is some... Uh, you know, signature, and there is even a little bit of signature which corresponds to the blue component that we're not even seeing in the intensity. This is really, this is really interesting. Like the blue component is so weak that we don't even see it in the intensity, yet it leaves a little bit of imprint in the polarization. Very nice. Okay, good. So this is, uh, you see that the polarization signal is fairly weak. It's like 5%. We can fit this later. We'll find something like, I think, 1,000 or, 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 you know, close to 1,000 line of sight magnetic field in this case. A reason for that is that this line is also fairly weak. Like, look how it's still, if you compare it in a relative sense, it's still like 10% line depth, which is more than in the quiet sun, but still very, very, not really fancy, right? Uh, the, and, and that explains why Stokes V is so weak. It is weak because when your intensity is in line is low, your derivative of intensity with uh, with respect to wavelength is low, and then your Stokes V is low. So here, why I'm saying derivative because I'm relating this to the weak field approximation, where the Stokes V is proportional to derivative of intensity with the wave. So we could now put it in the code, fit it. Maybe we would get something for Stokes Q and U. We probably wouldn't. Also because we're in the Umbra, so we do expect uh, what we have uh, vertical magnetic fields. Uh, but yeah, I mean, at least this Q and U will give you constraints on your magnetic field. In a sense, it cannot be too horizontal because otherwise we would see signal in Q and U. We can try to look at the penumbra if you want to try to see if we get some uh, some linear polarization there. Where is penumbra? I'm going back up because I want to be sure. Let's say 120. 
120, 120. Okay. So go like 220, 220. Yeah, certainly no signature there. Polarization even lower. Yeah, it's going to be hard. One interesting thing that some of you noticed is this patch here. I can try to, to extract the profile from there, try to see how that looks like, try to see what that um, is. I would say something like yeah, pixel number that's, that's 65 um, and then here 110. Uh, oh, so like the that. screen would be not side by side view at this point. It is something very interesting. The line is very asymmetric, right? Does everybody see that? It's weak, but it's very asymmetric. I can kind of shrink the limits on my I, I still shy so that you will better the see that. Computer. Before I realized that that's probably a pain for you to turn back on, so I apologize. See that the line is very, very stretched. For example, one of the examples where we where we would mm -hmm. not expect good results from a slab model, right? Some of you are interested in velocities. You're not that interested in uh, magnetic field, maybe. Uh, it sure does, yep. Well, um, this your does the host is but you can try to do video. multiple components fitting, and it's going to be much better. Still, probably not satisfactory, but it is going to be better. Reason for this, I don't know, it sounds like some sort of filament coming out of the sunspot and filament like structure coming out of the sunspot, and there is velocity gradient, and we're looking down that velocity gradient, and we see this. Uh, okay, what do we want to do is here now you have various different plots that you can you know, examine. One, here's some other penumbral moment. You see again, nice, yes. recognizable so V, it, but no so this was, um This was my mistake. So right. this was like... One more, still no... Here no, maybe there is a little bit of... But look at, at that. This event that. How not noisy the data is. The noise here is 10 so to the minus 3. Do you all agree? Full screen right. during video playback. Yet I don't see any signal. Um, on the it's hard. Polar, this all. is the main uh, reason why so polarimetry just, is so hard. Because reason, especially if you want to find your, your video horizontal magnetic field, it's going to be so screen. hard to measure that. It was a mistake. It's one of the reasons uh, why, we made, why we make these yeah. So we'll just switch the epifan out. So now we can, we have everything here, right? Just project. We don't know what our angle is, but first of all, a few things that I want to point. We are almost sure we are somewhere at the disk center. It would be so nice to know to whether we are exactly at the disk center, but we don't important. care. I don't care about my reference uh, uh, angle for uh, polarization. Why do I not care about it? This is one case where I can literally say, yeah, it's not that important. Like for prominence, it was super important yeah. here. It's really not, it's really not important. Okay, but well, both were in the in the chromosphere, but now I am where positionally at the disk center, Earth right? Two. All my polarization is due to Zeeman effect. So my linear polarization is going to be distributed between Q and U. So basically, whatever I choose for my reference system for my Q is just going to influence my azimuth estimation. Okay, and you have heard today we have to disambiguate azimuth anyway. So it's really not that's, important what my reference, what these reference angle it's here. Just a recording okay, of the two just need you to be constant over the map, and that's that's it. I have to worry about that. So here to set up things, it should be very very so simple. On the so here we're going to do situation uh, like this. this. I mean, because we're we're separate, my playback computer isn't plugged directly. One, what did I choose here? One hundred and forty. Like One hundred and ten. What is that? One hundred and forty. One hundred and one hundred and forty is here. 110 is here, so it's some penumbra. Okay, nice. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Yeah, that would, it would be the I'm same put these, for the um, full screen slides. I'm going to put these limits for wavelengths, 370, 220. So I'm only taking Whatever that range of wavelengths. Full screen. Uh, so I'm saving the wavelengths in a file. I'm calling it this wavelength. You don't have it, but when you click this, it will be generated. Here are weights, 111. Line of sight, I'm saying zero, 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 which means I'm at this center. More. My reference Just angle so for know, Q is zero. An entire uh, and here, what I'm doing is I'm creating my spectrum to fit. Keep in mind one thing. Yeah, I, I will put the noise to 10 to the minus three. We agreed before it's 10 to the minus three. Important part. Can somebody look, look at this line here? 
line here and tell me what I'm doing. Actually, all that all that block there. Let's have a look at all these blocks. Mm -hmm. I'm normalizing to the continuum, very good. Look at. Very good, exactly. So I'm normalizing with respect to the local continuum, to the continuum in that pixel. And here I'm then putting my, so, so my least, continuum is going to be one out, and I'm right. putting boundary condition equal to one. Equivalent thing to do okay. would be to normalize with respect to, you know, quiet sun continuum, but then I would have to change my boundary condition here. In order my calculated and my regular spectra work. Oh, by the way, there was this mysterious multiplication that we encountered a few days ago. Right. So what will Hazel do when you are off limb? You remember, we sorry, not off limb, but you are off, off disk center, but still on the disk. Hazel will automatically limp darken the radiation for you. So what you have to do to, to, to your code is you have to, uh, yeah. normalize these things like this and then multiply them with the co coefficient that explains your limb darken so the way you're going to do that is you're going to create a model in, in like forward synthesis mode so you're going to input your theta yeah. in that model you know you're going to uh, see what what yeah, uh, you know radiation the code gives you and you're going to multiply there are with a few that times that that will be simple but important in order so that you get that you I get guess. good things what i'm doing uh, here i'm doing the same thing as before i'm putting these you know headers basically about boundary condition, so on and so on, and I'm inputting my spectrum and my noise. That's it, and I'm saving the file. Nice. Okay. Should I? Do we need to stay in the Zoom meeting, or should we go over? Okay. I okay. save that. I'm not going to run this because Conf Grace right. I'm gonna doesn't exist. If I'm not mistaken, so that people can. So I'm going to copy Conf um, in it to Conf Grace gonna open conf gris I change it I'm gonna put uh, only two cycles here uh, I'm gonna delete this as we did previously I'm gonna delete this I'm gonna delete sorry no I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna delete this I'm gonna delete this and I'm gonna delete this and for this and this is gonna be called gris 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 Stokes code. It's called uh, 1080 degrees Stokes with small s. Like this. And then there was one more. It was called valent weight file, right? Oh, no. Yeah, sorry. Yes, wrong one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Add. Cool, and here I'm gonna fit uh, Stokes I in the first one, and uh, everything in the second one. I don't care. This is M, and it should be easy. And then this is all fine. Height is now tricky because we're in the disk center. We don't know what to take. I leave it at three. I don't know. Uh, now I need to increase these ranges for these ones because, in principle, my magnetic field could be very strong. Probably not two thousand, but could be quite strong. Optical depth, probably fairly weak. Line was never very deep. I will leave it at two, but yeah. Velocity as well. We saw this one with huge velocity gradients. I will allow it to vary a lot. I mean, now I'm fitting one pixel, so yeah, it doesn't matter. But in principle, just, just setting this up. Delta V is fine. Beta is fine. A is fine. This is fine. And then in the first one, I'm fitting just thermodynamic parameters. In the second one, I'm going to fit everything. And we see what happens now. So here I'm gonna change, we have the comp gris. Everything else is the same. I'm gonna just move verbose to two so that I don't overflow there and I run it. And um, 
yeah, there was the one thing that I didn't do. Should we have, well, output one is fine. Should the balance. So chi square is dropping very fast, dropping to like nine, which is quite fine. And then for polarized components, it's also dropping to 11, which is fine. I open the result here, same as before. It's called output one, right? And then I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna select the range of valence that I'm uh, that I use for fitting. I, I in principle, if we didn't create them in the notebook, we could just load them from the file, and then I'm gonna plot what I was fitting. So what I was fitting, I was fitting spectrum to fit, and here I was fitting. Here is the fit, the result. And you see fit in Stokes I is great, fit in Stokes V is great. Here we get something, we don't know. As I said, at least we're putting some constraints. We shouldn't really trust this. And uh, and see how beautiful it is. It's, it's really fitting the Stokes V super nicely, even if it's a simple, simple slab approximation, really, really nice. So now we can have a look at the parameters. And I'm gonna also plot the, plot the errors here. You shouldn't trust the errors, but yeah. And you see, bx, by, bz. This is the thing that we'll mostly care about. It's like 800 magnetic field, which I think is completely reasonable for penumbra chromosphere. Bx and by, I can't really trust them here. And you would see if we had the whole map and plotted that it would be all around the place. It wouldn't be nice as the map that Graham showed you today line is much less sensitive to the to the magnetic field. The code kind of knows that, but again, it severely underestimates these things here. Right. Go ahead, Marcel. Mm -hmm. Oh, I made a comment. I don't know why. Yeah, it's 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 really not important, though. Uh, really, really not important. Um, okay, so let me see what is the best thing for us to do now. Um, 2.35, we started at 1.30, so it's time to prepare for a break. Um, you know what, let's... Um, Rebecca, you said we should finish before uh, before 5.30, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, for that thing, let me see. Um, no, you know what, you know what, I'll just, I'll just show you real quick now a piece of code. I will send the link to the Discord. Uh, you can use it if you want. It's fully automatic. It is made for grease data though, so you have to adjust it if you want to use different data, but it's fully automatic. You literally just run it. It creates all these files for you, and then you can just run another command and run MPI inversion. So I'm just going to show you that, that it exists and what basically is the difference with respect to what we did here. And we're going to go on the break and when we come back, I'm going to give you a short talk about what we use actually Hanley Effect today for. So, so this is going to be the last little bit of work that we are doing with, with Hazel. So if you go to, to my Git and uh, you have it already there, so it shouldn't be hard to find. Uh, there is uh, the repositories. And then you can find Hazel route. Hazel route contains some functions that you, if you if you end up using this, you might uh, you might want to you know might want to have a look at them because they they give you they are, they, these are all for my own you know work, which have various kind of things. But the most recent one and most uh, most interesting one for this one is called pre-processing Blanca. This is the one that we are using to test the code on a supercomputer here in in uh, in NSO to like use the data. But since we the moment we only have this grease data, it's optimized for that. So you can use it for your for your own stuff, right? And for me, it's uh, it's here in uh, those Hazel route free. Um, yeah. So if you go there, you will see that. Basically, I'm doing in a streamlined way pretty much everything that we're doing here. So the only difference that that is there between that is different with respect to our uh, with respect to our notebook 
is there are also some comments so you kind of have a, have a look at them if you want uh, the only difference is that instead of writing a file in a txt file i'm creating a 3d array okay the 3d array is later going to be packed into something else and i'm creating 3d arrays for the stokes vectors for their errors and for the line of sight so code is that flexible that it allows you to have pixel dependent errors, pixel dependent uncertainties and pixel dependent coordinates. Why is that so? Well, if I'm really close to the limb, my, my viewing angle changes through my image. So code allows you to take care of that. Really, really, really neat. Also same for the prominence. Same for the boundaries in principle, although the boundary is almost always gonna be like this. And then what are we doing is we are creating a, a HDF5 file here just making different entries, Stokes, Sigma, line of sight, boundary, okay? And the code is also on top of all that, changing your configuration files and everything, okay? So the only thing that it expects, it expects to have this uh, example of a configuration file. So I can show you how, how all that works. If you go uh, to, for example, some place where I have data, Um, I have this test generic. Test generic, I have a small sub subset of this cube that we just had, it's 60 times 60. And I can literally type, okay, now, now the files are already here. I can literally type Python and then run the code. Pre-processing Blanca. And the name of this, to create everything for me. So it will, you will have to change some things for your own research because here I'm expecting to, you know, and so on, but it's a most up-to-date version of this that, for example, if you want to invert grease data from the Gregor Telescope database, you can just do it straight away. And then when you have this, you need this file, MPI invert, which is, uh, which can be found on my GitHub. And we can have a look at it. It's very, very simple. It's literally just making Hazel iterator, just saying here for the first time, use MPI equals true. Here it's doing, creating a model and running it, okay? And now what do I do? How do I run this? I run this with MPI exec. Oh, sorry, I need to go into Hazel. Um, I'm gonna do MPI exec the number of cores. Now this doesn't have many cores, but in principle, maybe on your workstations, you will have 16, 24 and so on. So here I'm gonna put six, then Python, then MPI exec, and then the number of the config file. If it's conf 60, 60 debug ini, I press it. Then what the code does is it's creating a system where it has one, uh, uh, you know, overseer thread and five, five worker threads, and it's sending out individual pixels. They're being inverted and they're packed, uh, you know, back. And then when this is done, it will, it will not be done for some time. It needs like 10 seconds per pixel. So you can calculate how much time is that gonna be. When it's done and you open the output, you open the output here, the shape will not be one for something, something. It will be as many pixels as you have for something, something. And then you reshape it back in the rectangle. You can plot it and do whatever you want. And then since we're here, show you what you can do with that. We have maps of the magnetic field. In this specific case, if you really want to dig into Hazel, you can make maps of the Simultaneously inverting silicon line and 1030 line. So here what you have is photospheric temperatures and the temperatures in the sunspot from the silicon line, this big line on the left of 1030. And here is the optical depth of 
of the of the helium 1030. So what you have here is we see that this little patch here, which was very fast and weird, was also uh, very optically thin, of optically thick for some reason. Then if we look at the velocities, the photosphere there is nothing. In the high photosphere there is nothing. In the chromosphere there is a huge shift in the velocities. And you can get these now with your installation. You just need to let your computer work a little while, or copy all this on the onto the server, and then server will do it fairly fast. Okay. So this is for this specific observation. Yeah. yeah. Well, depends. If you are, for example, working with Zeman effect on disk, the only thing that you have to change in the config file will basically be line of. It's not even in the config file, right? The line of sight will be changed in the in the data that you are preparing. So you only need to change names, basically, and maybe these valent things. Yeah. So once you kind of make, you know, get used to what is doing what, it's it's fairly easy to use. It's it's there, and the, a lot of things are in Python. So if you are not you know if you're not in a rush you can debug them on your own so i completely accidentally found some very innocent bugs some some weeks back that were you know following through the python codes and putting some prints and if you want to do that you can do when you install it you can install it as uh, python setup by develop instead of install and then it will uh, then your changes in the code will it will automatically reflect when you change it you don't have to reinstall it and you can put prints, you can put output to like follow what happens. And uh, it's kind of easy. Yeah. So if you want, you don't, you don't have to rush. I suggest we make a break like 15 minutes. Uh, so we will be done by four for, for sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, in the mean, if you don't want to go out and chill, you can just use these 15 minutes to invert some other pixels from this image or something like that. We can check on the progress of this inversion. Uh, okay, it didn't do much. It did only 42 out of 3,600. 3, so. This will take a lot of time, so I will just interrupt it now. Yeah. Sadly, I don't think it has a way to partially save the data. So this is now corrupted, but yeah, we don't care. Okay, good. Um, yeah, you can catch me on the break and ask me any kind of questions you have. I will leave the I will leave leave up the presentation for uh, our uh, next um, next final talk. Okay. experiment with this huge telescope and everything or small telescope and everything whatever to to measure Hanlon effect nobody does that right it's kind of obscure things so i thought maybe i can sum up some papers and results and so on and concepts that are commonly talked about that we can uh, so that uh, we kind of you know circle this this completely and you already saw some examples of the data you saw the examples of the theory so now you can uh, uh, i can kind of show you about a little bit more things and the first thing to to kind of hint here is that it's true that prominences and filaments because they are suspended in the corona they scatter the light that they are prime suspects for Hanley effect and scattering polarization but there are more spectral lines for example your commonly used beloved 8542 that all of you want to use for dickies or your other instruments it exhibits Hanley effect and in the quiet sun if you have signal to noise you might see it even if you don't want to see it you might see it so it's good to know that you that, that it exists there uh, there is this strontium 4607 line that I talked about that also exhibits scattering polarization. And always keep in mind that Hanlon effect has this wide range of sensitivities depending on what spectral line you choose and also where is where it's formed. So and the, and the reason for that is that uh, you know uh, the reason for that is that on top of the their sensitivities because of their different uh, uh, scattering uh, sorry um, Einstein coefficients. Uh, another thing that kind of makes them more sens sensitive is are the collisions, and we're going to be talking about the collisions a little bit. And in prominences and filament, it's nice to employ Hanley effect because radiative transfer is simple. You just calculate the source function, you multiply it with the appropriate direction, voila, you get the thing that you want. Not always that easy. We will see now. Some people are making 3D models of prominences, so maybe there, when you calculate stuff, it becomes more interesting, more complicated. But uh, yeah, we don't know. In principle, it's simple. But now some of you might be wondering, hey, you told us that there are spectral lines in the photosphere and the chromosphere that exhibit scattering polarization and Hanley effect. Uh, what happens there? How do I calculate source function there? What is being solved there? Well, there the situation is quite a bit more complicated. And uh, in principle, it's something called non-LTE problem of the second kind. 
So if you go to these polarization workshops or conferences like that, and somebody mentions non-LTE problem of the second kind, it's basically non-LTE problem involving the scattering polarization. And what you see here is a little bit of a reminder what problem we generally have in non-LTE for the most simple case of a two-level atom. So this is radiative transfer equation that is fairly easy to integrate, and this is the solution of the radiative transfer equation. If I know source function on optical depth grid, I know the outgoing intensity. Where do I get optical depth grid? I get it from the Z and chi. That's fairly simple. However, we don't know the source function very often because it's given by the scattering term here. And this is for your 85, 42, magnesium H and K, calcium H and K, H alpha, and so on and so on. Not like this, even more complicated, but this is the simplest example. So what do you do? As Han told you, you iterate this equation and this equation, hop, 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 hop. You use some tricks to make it converge faster and eventually you reach correct solution. And then you see that the shape of the spectral line is significantly different with respect to what LTE would tell you. So what is then non-LTE problem of the second kind? Well, it is similarly the, the same way that the radiation and matter are coupled both ways. What does it mean both ways? Well, in LTE, our radiation is created by the matter. So I know the state of the matter from the temperature and pressure. I can, I can generate my uh, radiation. I can generate my opacity emissivity and then get intensity and that's it. In non-LTE, so sp speaking now in a little bit more general case, uh, radiation and matter are coupled both ways. So matter influences radiation, but radiation also influences matter, right? Because the, the excitation and de-excitation, ionization are all, are all you know, uh, di ducti dictated by the radiation field. Polarization is all one step further, right? Instead of just taking care of the level populations, I have to take care of the sub-level populations, more specifically, their imbalances and their coherences, what we talked about on Wednesday. And these will be determined not only by the not only by the radiation field, not only by the mean intensity, but also by the polarization of the radiation field and my multipolar components, my J02, J12, and so on, and so on. And I can write all these things for a two-level atom again to make it obvious what is happening here. And if I write it for a two-level atom, I will have a radiative transfer equation. Here I wrote it, um, here there shouldn't be lambda, it should be just D tau. But here I have some sort of radiative transfer equation that now takes care that maybe I also have Zeman effect on top of everything, just to be more general. This is the source function, which is not Planck function in general, but is a consequence of scattering, right? How do I get it? Well, first of all, it's valent dependent. It has some thermal term, which we have neglected so far, but in the atmosphere, we cannot neglect it anymore. It has this, you know, other scattering term. I'm gonna skip these two quantities for now. It has a scattering matrix, which depends on the magnetic field, incoming angle, outgoing angle, and I'm integrating over the all incoming angle. And then we said that in principle, what we should do when we do this, we should pose this scattering matrix in the coordinate system tied to B. We should decompose it using the spherical tensors, and we can solve this problem by, again, iteratively solving these two equations here. Source function is generally further affected by two more coefficients. One is the so-called intrinsic line polarizability. It only affects the polarized components of the source function. So it can make a line scatter less, I mean, exhibit less scattering polarization than the normal Zeman triplet. And there is also so-called collisional depolarization, which I here simplified, just putting some factor delta. In principle, there are multiple contributions for this. There are collisional de-excitation contributes to this but also elastic collisions. What are elastic collisions? Elastic collisions are just the collisions that shake up atom a little bit. They don't create energy transfer. They don't move the electrons from one energy level to the other one, but they just influence the atom a little bit. Example of elastic collisions are the collisions that create damping, right? You talked about this, all these, you know, uh, coefficients that Carlos told you about that you need to put in your lines in CERS so that they will have good shape. These are the collision, these are the damping coefficients. They need to be there in order to have the good shape of your line. And they're created by uh, nearby passes of other particles. They're not really collisions. The particles are not really colliding because you know Coulomb force will prevent that. 
Same thing can happen for polarization. When I have my population imbalances in one level and some, some you know, particle hits it slightly, these electrons can jump from one level to the other one, from one sub-level to the other sub-level, and basically no energy is needed for that. Very small, actually no energy is needed for that, right? Also, in principle, polarization can be created by something called impact, which means if I have anisotropic collisions, they can create polarized radiation. And that's maybe important in flare. So once again, this is the simplest possible example of the non-LTE problem of the second kind. And I need to integrate, I need to iteratively solve these two equations, right? And okay, maybe a little uh, anecdote. There was one of these conferences that I told you about where a few people from different fields were gathering. It was in Prague. And of course, most of these theoretical talks were given by solar physics people. And then some German guy came who does galaxies. And he was like, I hear you guys always use this word self-consistent. What does it mean, self-consistent? What do you mean? Self-consistent means to solve these two equations so that they are both satisfied. That's what self-consistent means. I find the value of the intensity everywhere in the atmosphere at all the valence and the polarization as well so that both of these equations are, you know, consistent. And you have a lot of papers and a lot of books that deal with this. You have a book by Landy Daniel Chanti and Ladolfi from 2004. You have multiple reviews and papers from Javier Trujillo Bueno. And if you have various simplified approaches by, for example, Reese, uh, Marianne Forover, Ellen Trish, and so on and so on, where, where you have some toy problems, some you know, theoretical investigations to show how these things work, there is a lot of nice interplay between the scattering polarization and radiative transfer. Where you can really see some, some interesting stuff. Okay. Good. One thing that you will encounter there, and actually the way why we care about these photospheric and chromospheric lines is something called turbulent Hanle effect. What is turbulent? Well, if, if you know, Matthias was here, he would maybe mind that we are using this turbulent term very you know, lightly. But when we say turbulent, we mean something that we cannot resolve. It does not have to have anything to do with turbulence. For example, micro turbulent velocity probably not turbulent. It's just on such a small scales that it's randomly oriented and it additionally broadens our lines. What is in this case turbulent magnetic field? But it's magnetic field that is mixed and oriented in all the directions on very small scales that we cannot resolve. That field would also cause Hanley effect, except contrary to Zeeman, where that field would completely cancel. For the Hanley effect, it would still cause some depolarization. It would not rotate things, but it would decrease the depolarization. So people came with the idea of using scattering polarization to estimate this turbulent magnetic field in the solar atmosphere, because you don't need any spatial resolution to do that. Of course, if you see it in very small pixels, it's very cool because you, it means that you have these magnetic fields structured on the sub-pixel scales, right? And this, the formal way to express this turbulent Hanley effect is through additional depolarization mechanism, a uh, depolarization number constant that I hear to call omega h, right? It will influence the source function, uh, uh, the, the components of the source function with k equals two. So j02, j12, j minus, s minus one two, s one two, and so on and so on by multiplying them with this number here. This number here depends on the, on the magnetic field. So if magnetic field is saturated, this H is huge, right? This thing here is one. This thing, uh, sorry, this thing here is, I think there is a constant missing in front. Uh, there is two over five here, constant miss, sorry. Yeah, now, now it looks wild because now it's gonna go to minus one. The point is that uh, no matter how strong the magnetic field is, it will, never destroy this thing here. So this, the minimum value of this is 0 0.2. I missed the constant in front. Sorry about that. Uh, the, the other point here that I want to make is that now in the photosphere and chromosphere, we have to care about the collisions. So in principle, if, if we are in the photosphere where there is a lot of colliding particles, your line will be less sensitive to the magnetic field. Another thing, so you should know these collisions in order to make it, to make it work. And what people were doing is they would say, okay, I can, Somehow, by comparing my observed polarization and predicted polarization, estimate this WH from this WH, I can find H and I can find what kind of typical magnetic fields I have here. And one of the 
most famous results for this was this nature paper from 2004 where they look at center to limb variation of scattering polarization now we don't actually know what center to limb variation is you're probably guessing uh, but okay we're going to explain all that and we're going to go there their whole idea is if i know the amount of polarization in magnetic field free case i can infer the depolarization i can infer the magnetic field so what they deal with here is the amount of the scattering polarization in strontium 4607 line observed at different distances from the limb and the reason why there is no images here why there is nothing else is because there is no spatial resolution they put slit somewhere and they add all the contributions from the slit why because otherwise they would not have enough signal to noise you can see that the maximum signal to noise is one percent very close to the limb at mu equals 0 0.05 and that it drops to less than 0 0.2 percent when you go to the mu of 0 0.6 and they have this center to lip variation and then for weaker magnetic fields that curve should be higher up it's a curve right because this is log so it looks like you know, something and uh, and for zero gauss it's for example here for 300 gauss it's here for 60 gauss it's and this has quite some uh, quite some uh, uh, you know th there, there is some modeling involved there and we kind of explained why there is no spatial resolution introduced here the other question is if you read this paper you will find that the authors even though the observations have no spatial resolution whatsoever they're using a three-dimensional solar model three-dimensional solar model three-dimensional uh, atmospheric model does anybody have an idea why is that so why are they using the 3d model to explain spatially unresolved observations hmm? yes but uh, but uh, it, it, the model is very small it will not really you know contain that maybe there is influence on like central variations but there is something else yes exactly it exactly has to do that it has something to do with which han already mentioned which is what we usually call multi-dimensional radiative transfer or lateral radiative transfer or or you know a horizontal inhomogeneities or something like that if we if you remember i asked you to sketch this example where there is more light coming from one side than from the other side and in, in this in these situations you're going to have additional sources of anisotropy that are not only going to cause you to see Stokes U, but they're also going to influence your Stokes Q to begin with. And there we enter in the field of the multidimensional radiative transfer, and that is a complicated thing. It's a complicated thing because you're not integrating your radiative transfer equation one point by one point. You are in some 3D medium, which is given by your you know, simulation data or your imposed model or something like that. And there is a lot of nice numerical things there. I mean, you in principle have to watch how these you know lines of sight propagate from one phase to the other phase where they intersect your grid and so on and so on but in principle you care whether the photon is coming from the left or coming from the right or from the front or from the back which in 1d you don't care about all the azimuthal angles are the same right okay so going back to these turbulent fields we kind of now understand and why is that important so first of all there is no spatial resolution because polarization is very weak so we need to integrate over huge amounts and proper calculation of the source term involves all the all the elements here right but people okay now we can talk a little bit actually sorry i don't have the, the following slides so I, i'm always surprised like when i click next okay uh sorry about that uh what i wanted to show a little bit to you here is to tell you that in multi-dimensional cases these some additional polarization is naturally going to to arise so what you have here is a very simple two-dimensional model what is two-dimensional well we have here a rectangle that is limited in x and y it's infinite along z so it's also like a slab suspended above the solar surface but now it's a slightly different slab than what hazel uses and we let the radiation illuminate it and we let it scatter inside and here is like something like simulated spectra so what you see is you see uh this is wavelength this is intensity so this is like a spectrum so it's always an emission line makes sense we are used to that emission line 
And here we see Stokes Q. Here I defined it as a positive Stokes Q. So you see some positive Stokes Q. Stokes U is in principle zero through the slab, but at the edges, it's not. It has some, you know, signs. What is, why is there some Stokes Q? And also you see amplified Stokes Q. Well, because we are at the edges of the object and edges of the object, because there, there is radiation coming from one side and then from the other side is different because on one side there is medium, on the other side there is no medium. So I automatically get some anisotropy of the radiation field because this one coming from here is a little bit absorbed. This one coming from here is not absorbed. So I get some linear polarization. And it kind of makes sense that it has the opposite signs because it cares about the side. Now, of course, the question is why don't we see this in real life? Well, we don't see it in real life because we don't really have like blocks of prominences. They are very diffuse. So once you, when you get to the end of the prominence, and it's already so, you know, a counter, count whatever opposite of dense is that you won't be seeing it anyway, right? So you, you, you can't see these edge effects here. Okay, so then we can make it a little bit more complicated, this kind of example. And in this case, what we did is we, we made some blobs here in 2D. We make like over densities through this model. And these over densities, what do they do? Well, they now create your Stokes U everywhere in that slab and also your Stokes Q is changing. And here we also added some magnetic field and that magnetic field created some Zeman effect. I didn't know back then about grays, right? So I've made everything in color. So this is why it doesn't really look like a spectrum but we could make it that way. And then you could go to even more complicated example. So this is from a recent paper by Delpino Aleman where you can see that done for a very complicated 3D model of the solar atmosphere coming from Muram, where they consider strontium 4607 line with all the scattering and all the movement. And here, because the things are not homogeneous at the disk center, you see that around granules, these white regions are granules, these are intergranules, you see polarization. It's like each of these is a little sun, right? It's a little sun that it has negative polarization here, positive polarization here, right? Except these are granules, one next to each other. And then there is also Stokes U, which is at 45 degrees. Very cool. There is no magnetic field in this case, so you don't see anything else except these signatures, right? And then as you move toward the limb, at least in Stokes Q, you see more and more positive polarization. They defined it positively here. Uh, you see more and more polarization of one sign because you are getting more and more dominated by this kind of limb darkening effect by this J02 in the, in the scattering polarization. But for Stokes U, it's not like that. It always exhibits more, both negative and positive sources, right? And this is what we hope to observe with DKs. We hope to really resolve these because for this, you know, if you now you know, apply instrumental effects and so on, you will see that you need both spatial resolution and and signal to noise ratio to resolve these signals. And also this will all be modified by the presence of the magnetic field, right? And the same thing happens in the chromosphere. This is the same prediction, similar prediction by Yuri Stepan for, uh, uh, okay, contrast here is not very beautiful for uh, calcium 8542. The important thing here is that what you can see is that what, what they did here is they did through some very thorough work. So this is a 3D calculation of the intensity at the disk center, 3D calculation of linear polarization at the disk center. And this here tells you how big mistakes you're making uh, if you ignore that photons can travel horizontally, right? If you use the so-called 1.5D approach. What is 1.5D approach? 1.5D approach means I treat each pixel of my simulation independently. Now, if your line is LTE, that is fine because radiation, you only care about one direction of propagation anyway, but in non-LT you care about the old direction, so that's important. And it's very interesting here, because if you look, you will see that not even the, that the total intensity is the same, not even the average line profile is gonna be the same. There are gonna be small difference, okay? Right, so going back to turbulent Hanley effect, because that's the only thing that we can observe and that we could observe until now, I'm now really annoyed by forgetting this constant here. So you, in your heads, you enter a constant here. And uh, uh, what we're gonna, uh, what I want to talk about is that people have been working on this for quite some time. So these are some of the first results by Marianne Forabert in 1993. So I didn't even know what, what sun is in 1993, God forbid scattering polarization. 
observation and observations made in 1980 by Stenflow. So what you see here is another set of, uh, you know, center to limb variation, right? And uh, these are different points here. Sorry, these, uh, these different lines are observations and their uncertainties. And different points are calculations from a 1D atmospheric model. So back in 1993, it was very hard to calculate things in 3D. They could only do 1D models. And you know that in 1D model, there will be scattering polarization because of horizontal anisotropies, right? That's one thing that I didn't emphasize much, but it's important to remember. Even in 1D, you will get scattering polarization. The reason for that is that radiation field is always going to be somehow anisotropic. It's not really black body. The only reason to get the isotropic radiation is to have constant temperature here, which would then be equal to black body radiation, which is completely isotropic. And then there is no, then there is no way to get scattering polarization. Otherwise, as long as soon as you have some gradient, you have an isotropic radiation field, and even the smallest amount of scattering will create some scattering polarization, right? So what she could do here is tune the magnetic field to get the values, and then they followed with a lot of, lot of different, different simulations. It turned out sometimes in 2000s that, that molecular lines are very suitable for this, and this is from the paper of uh, Svetlana Berdugina and Dominique Fleury. They are one of the first to, to really systematically do that. And here you have some lines of, uh, what is it, carbon-2, around uh, 500 nanometers, okay? So in a very accessible region of the spectrum. And you see here the amount of scattering polarization they exhibit. Very small, 0 0.1. And this is from, you know, huge region of the sun. This is spatially integrated. Otherwise you couldn't see so small detail. And what they saw here is they saw that, you know, they need to introduce some magnetic field to reconcile predicted, which is dashed, and observed, which is full lines for scattering polarization. Why use molecular lines and not one of these lines with more polarization? Well, first of all, there is a lot of molecular lines. You have them in many, many parts because of the bands. The other one is that different components, different, different parts of these bands have different intrinsic polarizability. Oh, sorry, they have, they don't have to have different, different polarizabilities. They have different sensitives, sensitivities to the magnetic field. So you can use something called differential Hanley effect. What is the what, what means differential for us typically in solar physics? It means we find two quantity, we find two observables that are uh, where that are only that only differ in one way. For example, if I have two lines of C2, they come from the same element that is in the same abundance, that is formed in the same conditions, at the same height, that sees the same anisotropy, and only differences, for example, sensitivity to the magnetic field. Then from their difference of their polarizations, I can infer a magnetic field. And all these people, including some more works found pretty much, um, uh, so going back to this result here, all these people found that magnetic fields found from these observations fall somewhere between a few tens of Gauss and maybe 100-ish or, or at max 200 Gauss. Maybe some of you are care thinking what this is. Well, in this paper, they also said well, what if the magnetic field is not constant, but it follows some exponential PDF, so I have more weak uh, and less strong magnetic fields. In that case, some typical strength would be 130 Gauss, and so on, and so on. And the main reason why we are not super crazy about these results and why you don't know about them is that they basically tell us the same thing that he know they would tell you, right? If I'm looking at the resolution of 10 arc seconds times 10 arc seconds or more, more I might as well just go and look at the Hinode and get, you know, individual magnetic fields, and they agree very well. But once we are able to do this on pixel by pixel basis with Dickies, then we will learn much more because we will be able to see, oh, is there a turbulent magnetic field on very small scales? How does it compare with what Zeman tells you? And so on and so on. Okay, cool. Going, going, going further. This is another application that we already played with. I think you actually had an example like this. Maybe you have it along your data that I gave you. Maybe it's like A5 or A4 or, or something like that. Uh, people have been looking at these for a while. This was uh, you know, when people started developing Hazel, I think. It wasn't still called Hazel, but it existed somewhere or 